So hey guys. This is your favorite the fanfic club. So in this video. We will see what if Naruto was a devil's biju, the prince of hell. Summary says. Things had been going so well. Then Hinata chose that moment of all times to show her backbone. Though in all fairness, none of them expected to end up in hell. But before we start, remember to subscribe and like this video. Now let's start. Hinata Hyuga was generally recognized as a very calm and patient person. Everyone that knew her would say so and some would even go as far as state that she would not hurt a fly. The later was, of course, an exaggeration as she would not have been allowed to graduate the Konoha Ninja Academy, never mind become a chunin and fight in the war, had she been unwilling to spill blood. That being said, for all her kindness and overall niceness, she had limits. Her sister being kidnapped and having her eyes stolen, her world being threatened, her crush apparently receiving and treasuring gifts from another woman and most recently herself being kidnapped, brainwashed and almost married to the man who wanted to wipe out all chakra users went past what she could stand. Thus, when her kidnapper and wannabe husband, Tonari Otsutsuki, drew the thousands of Byakugan eyes of his ancestors onto himself and began molding that obscene amount of chakra in a last, desperate, spiteful and suicidal attempt at killing the chakra users and her crush, Naruto Uzumaki, in particular, she did not wait to see what her whiskered blonde savior had planned to deal with the situation. She picked up one of the kanai Naruto had dropped nearby and with a chakra enhanced throw she buried it in Tonari's skull to the hilt, right between the eyes. She had always had good aim. Of course, rather than things ending there, it only got worse. Behind the uncontrollably mutating form of Tonari opened a rift in space not unlike those she had seen Obito Uchiha open as well as Kakashi Hataki back when he still had Obito's right Sharingan. Only unlike those, this rift was growing further and further and soon enough rather than their planet all she could see was a sea of colors melding one into another. Then, she and Naruto were sucked into it, and unknown to them, the entire moon followed before the rift closed leaving those down in the elemental nations wondering what the hell had Naruto done this time. Time skip. Days later as she awoke and her eyes opened, Hinata was treated to the sight of an unfamiliar ceiling and blinked a few times before her eyes began darting around, first focusing on a floating glowing green sign that had several circle and unknown glyphs on it that faded from existence under her very eyes. Some sort of jutsu. She thought as she got in a sitting position and looked down at her body. Someone changed my clothes. She instantly noticed as she was no longer in the dress Tonari had put her into but in a plain yet comfortable light blue nightgown. As she began to look around the room, a near identical sign to that she had seen earlier appeared on an empty part of the floor, only larger, and in it appeared with a flash of light three figures, two of which she recognized while the third she did not. Hanada. Sakura exclaimed as she hurried to her side, instantly beginning to run a diagnostic jutsu over her. How are you feeling? I'm, okay. Hanada said slowly, eyeing the pink haired girl curiously. Should I not be? What happened? How did we get here, and where is here? As you were among the first to pass through the portal, you were exposed the longest to the full brunt of the corrosive atmosphere of the dimensional gap, the space Tonari's portal opened to. Shikamaru stepped closer with the tall blue eyed, green haired man. You were hurt the worst, since unlike Naruto, you don't have a healing factor. You've been asleep and healing for five days. Sakura explained as she ended her diagnostic. Thankfully, you're fully healed now. Lord Beelzebub does great work. Beelzebub. Hanada's eyes went to the stranger. Indeed. My name is Ajuka Beelzebub. I was doing some recon work with a colleague of mine in the dimensional gap when a moon almost dropped on our heads, almost laterally. Ajuka commented with wry amusement. I must confess that is not something I ever expected to experience. For good reason. Shikamaru snorted. He is the one that saved us. Without appropriate protection, things dissolved in the dimensional gap. Once he realized what was happening, the Kyubi hurried and took us all inside his chakra cloak but the damage was done and our wounds were not healing. Had it not been for Beelzebub Sans and Leviathan Sans arrival, we would have all broken down completely a few minutes later. Our chakra provided a surprising amount of protection given that most humans die instantly, but as things stood, it was only prolonging our deaths. Sakura sighed. I used an experimental version of my finest creations, the evil pieces, to save your lives once I took you all out of the dimensional gap, but even with the particularly strong regenerative powers I've managed to program in those particular pieces, it took a while for you all to heal. So, everyone is okay? I was the last one to awake? 
Hanada inquired. Not quite. Sakura said sheepishly. While you took the longest to heal, Naruto still hasn't awoken yet. He's taking longer to turn than you did, probably due to the size of his chakra and the Kyubi. Turn? Hanada blinked. The evil pieces don't just heal people. They transform them into devils. Ajuka helpfully explained. We're in hell. Shikamaru told her bluntly. A blink later, Hanada passed out. As she awoke sometime later, it was explained to her that they were in a different world entirely that had several dimensions attached to it, not unlike the ones Kagaya Otsutsuki had created. It was also explained that while not entirely false, Shikamaru's statement was an oversimplification. The underworld was part of hell, the uppermost level in fact, that had been turned livable after Lucifer and a third of heaven's angels fell with him into that level of hell where Satan turned them into devils. The great war between angels, devils and fallen angels was explained to her, as was its ending that left the three biblical factions decimated, with the four Mao dead leading to their descendants attempting to take their place. It was also explained to her about the civil war where the old Mao faction was defeated and the leaders of the rebellion became the new four Mao, Sears X Lucifer formerly Gremory, Ajuka Beelzebub formerly Astaroth, Seraphal Leviathan formerly Citri and Falbium Asmodeus formerly Glacia Labalas. It was then explained to her how the evil pieces in the peerage system worked and she found it rather similar in some ways to how things worked between the Hyuga main and branch house, minus the built-in kill and torture switch. Finding out that the man who had saved them was not only one of the leaders of the underworld, but on par with the upper-ranked Biju in destructive power unnerved her, but his laid-back attitude put her fears to rest at least for the moment. She had other things to worry about, namely her sister and Naruto. As it turned out, Hanabi had been the least wounded despite missing her eyes at the time and the first to be turned due to her smaller chakra reserves. Oh, her younger sister had at least upper Chunin chakra reserves, but by comparison her reserve was the smallest. The one who awoke next was Sai who while being a Tokabetsu Janin had only high Chunin level reserves, followed by Shikamaru with his low Janin reserves. A couple days after it was Sakura's turn who despite having the lowest reserves amongst them all also had her yin seal that held near cage level reserves. With Hanada awaking on the eve of the fifth day, likely due to her now massive chakra reserves thanks to Hamura Otsutsuki's gift that appeared to have persisted beyond the destruction of the Tensigen, only Naruto remained asleep. She visited him every few hours between catching up to the realities of their new life, but there was more to take in than she could imagine in Kurama. The Kiyubi spent his all his time at Naruto's side in the magically expanded room, unwilling to return to the seal and rejoin the portion of himself he had left there in order to avoid lengthening Naruto's transformation further, as well as a possible death as they were unsure how the evil pieces affected Biju. Apparently, while newly reincarnated devils like herself and the others normally started off as low-class devils under their king who was a high-class devil or above, things were different for the four Mao in that they were given two months to accustom to their new circumstance before being tested in combat, and depending on their performance they received a rank. This deviation to the rules was due to idea that the four Mao would not reincarnate into their peerage just anyone and it would be shame to waste their potential for months, even years, as was the custom before letting them take the class advancement exam. So, since the four Mao were not just the leaders of the devils but also the strongest amongst them, the power of their servants would be tested and ranks granted accordingly. At the surface, with the peerage of Sears X Lucifer being what newcomers were tested against, the masses tended to believe that the peerages of all the Mao were overpowered and it was only natural to test them against the strongest. The reality was different. While indeed the peerage of the Lucifer was well-oiled war machine, he was the only one who had built his peerage like that. The peerage of the Asmodeus was composed of capable members of the military specializing in tactics that had sought Falbium's favor and after being recruited had most of his work dumped on their heads while he lazed around. The peerage of the Leviathan was the most diverse in terms of the original species of the members since as the one in charge of relations with other factions Seraphal had simply chosen the most influential and more importantly the cutest members of those factions she could find and reincarnate, giving her a wide information network to work with as well as actors for her magical girl TV show. Ajuka, however, was perhaps the worst when it came to his peerage. Not that he mistreated them, far from it. No person ever reincarnated by him ever complained of his lot in life. Simply put, Ajuka had realized from the beginning of his work as the head of the Underworld's R&D department that devils had surprisingly little imagination when it came to the creation of new things which was what he specialized in. So, 
he turned to other species, particularly humans. Many would be surprised to hear how many famous human inventors and innovators had been reincarnated by him, and soon after released from his peerage to simply work for him rather than serve him. Simply put, Ajuka cheated. Normally, a king had a limit of how many peerage members they could release from their service in the form of a set number of evil pieces they were allowed to replace per century. As the evil pieces could not be removed from the reincarnated devils permanently without killing them for a variable amount of years after reincarnating them, at least usually, as there had been exceptions, this prevented kings from releasing their servants from service and encouraging them to trade instead if they wanted to get rid of a specific servant. This rule was ostensibly put in place due to the price in both time and materials that went into the creating the evil pieces. In reality, the government simply did not want too many reincarnated devils to go around unchecked. Ajuka was not bound by that rule. Being the creator of the evil pieces, he could make his own replacement pieces and had done so time and time again. True, the vast majority of those had been pawns with the occasional bishop thrown in, so nobody raised a stink about it, but the fact remained that few remained in his peerage beyond their combat assessment. In his case, the assessment almost always took place privately as there was no point to show off pawns that would likely not rank beyond middle class if that high and would be released soon after. This time, it was not the case. His new servants were not merely brilliant men and women, sometimes even previously unaware of the supernatural world, whom he wanted purely in order to have some intelligent company. Not that they were stupid. No, even without knowing the details of their backgrounds he could tell just from their expressions, speech patterns and eyes that they were all high up in their fields, the pineapple-haired Shikamaru in particular seriously setting off his, this guy is a genius. Alarms. But beyond what he usually looked for in the people he reincarnated, these shinobi were powerful and more importantly completely and utterly new. Their energy, their craft, their way of life, it was all new and from what he had witnessed so far entirely worth exploring. Not that he had seen much, mind you. Accustomed to secrecy as they were, the shinobi hid most of their arsenal and focused on adapting to their new circumstances. From what Ajuka could tell, they were waiting for their still transforming friend, Naruto Uzumaki, to awaken before making any decisions, and Ajuka could certainly see why, as with his power his choice in the matter would make or break any plans they had. Oh, they thought themselves discreet, and for most they likely were, however Ajuka was accustomed to monitoring every moment of his new servants to check for potential betrayal early on, so he knew what they were planning and was rather impressed with the deductions and hypotheses of the Nara as well as the surveillance capabilities of the Hyuga's eyes. Which made him even more thankful that he had close to a hundred of those eyes along with the body of the man who had probably brought them into the dimensional gap. Toneri Otsutsuki was beyond even his improved evil pieces to revive, both time-wise and damage-wise, but that did not mean he would not learn from his body perhaps just as much as he will from his new servants. It was only on the fifteenth day after his transformation into a devil began that Naruto Uzumaki awoke, with a growling stomach and demanding the food of the gods, ramen. Time skip. Two months after Naruto awoke, assessment exam. Grafia Lucifuge waited patiently for her opponent to arrive within the raiding field dimension prepared for the combat assessment of Naruto Uzumaki. In all honesty, she was rather conflicted about it. On the one hand, she was quite surprised she finally had the chance to fight against the queen of Ajuka Beelzebub for the simple reason that he never expected him to get one. She was well aware of how he chose his servants, by not power but intelligence, and as such none of his previous servants had required her presence. In fact, other than the pawns Beowulf and Enku, only the Bishop McGregor Mathers had done any combat assessment with Ajuka's servants in the past for the rare magician that caught his eye and on whom it would have been a waste not to use a bishop rather than three pawn pieces. Now though, Ajuka suddenly pulled out of nowhere not one but six new servants that required assessment, and one of them was a queen. Other than Ajuka himself, the only one who seemed to know anything about them was Seraphal and she was unusually tight-lipped about it. On the other hand, she felt rather insulted by Seraphal, for whom she had been a rival in claiming the position of Leviathan, when the former Seatree told her to be careful and not get killed. She was an ultimate class devil, for goodness sake, on par with the Satans themselves. The mere idea of some no-name reincarnated devil besting her was ridiculous. No, she was nearly certain that this Naruto Uzumaki, a man of Asian descent going by his name, was simply the possessor of one of the thirteen Longinus sacred gears that Ajuka had happened across and reincarnated for the simple purpose of having one of the legendary tools on hand to experiment on. 
In other words, the worth of Uzumaki Naruto himself was only of one pawn piece, maybe two if his Longinus was among the lower class ones. When the blue sea tree teleportation circle appeared on the ground around 20 meters away from her, Grafia decided that it was likely that her opponent had no experience with manipulating his magic, an observation she made due to the way the teleportation spell was overpowered. More than likely, the newborn devil was pushing as much power as he could in it in an attempt to make it work better despite his inexperience with it. As the blonde in his late teens appeared from the circle, she was not impressed. Sure, he was rather handsome and the whisker-like scars or birthmarks on his cheeks gave him an exotic look, but power-wise she was not feeling much from him so she decided her assumption of the necessity of the queen piece being due to Alonginus was likely accurate. He was also not the intellectual type given his carefree grin. The rank assessment of Naruto Uzumaki Dono, newly reincarnated queen of Ajuka Beelzebub Sama, will begin shortly. His opponent shall be Grafia Lucifuge Dono, queen of Sirzex Lucifer Sama. Combatants, please stand by. The announcer instructed. As Grafia tensed in preparation, she was rather unnerved by how confident the blonde seemed to look as he entered a loose stance. What Longinus does he have? Grafia wondered. It's not the true Longinus otherwise I would have felt some holy power from him, nor the Zenith Tempest as it's in the hands of the church's strongest. Divine Dividing and Canis Lycon have been confirmed to have sided with the Gregory. Maybe it's the dimension lost. If he can send my attacks to artificial dimensions, then I suppose he could be arrogant enough to consider himself untouchable, she considered. 3, 2, 1, begin. The announcer declared, and a moment later Naruto was right in her face, barely giving her enough time to summon a wall of ice between them. Fast. She thought with wide eyes before she found herself being flung away dozens of meters as her ice wall exploded. Looking towards the source, she saw him lowering his fist, and strong. That ice wall was a rush job but it would take raw strength on par with Surtur to destroy it so quickly and so devastatingly. Deciding that she was embarrassing herself by allowing a newbie to send her flying, she went on the offensive and called up a dozen or so large magic circles over her shoulder from which hundreds of ice spears began to shoot at the blonde and his surroundings. As she halfway expected, the blonde dodged between the rain of ice spears relative ease, so she made her next move, something she generally used against knights but it was just as usable against queens that over relied on the knight aspect of their evil peace. She turned the floor to ice and waited with a half smile for him to slip, only for her expression to become shock when he proved to have no less grip on the mirror like ice than he would on coarse stone. More than that, as the finished dodging the last of the spears he seemed to decide to respond in kind with his own magical attack as he raised an arm above his head, only for no magic circles to appear. Rather, a ball of swirling energy appeared in his hand before it grew until it was larger than his head gaining a pale greenish-white aura with a ring of swirling white blades. What made her hair stand out, though, was the bell-like screech that the spell was emitting. Then, he threw it right at her and she immediately dodged it by taking to the sky before turning her head slightly to see the effects. The large stone outcropping that had been behind he was cut all the way through the moment the white blades of what she realized to be wind magic touched it and soon after the entire structure was swallowed up by a massive white dome of swirling winds. Her eyesight was not anything special by devil standards, but she could clearly see how within that dome the solid volcanic stone was being shredded to dust by the maelstrom of millions of tiny wind blades. That attack is dangerous, she realized instantly. Even a glancing blow may cause incalculable damage to me, rook defense or not. Naruto was not content to letting her analyze his attacks though and as soon as he felt that she was not giving him enough attention in favor of his Rosenshuriken, he disappeared from his spot before appearing midair just in time to pound her through the ice wall she summoned on reflex several yards away, forming a trench through the ground before she stopped. When she did, though, she was no longer holding back. The opening greetings, as they were, had been delivered and from here on out they were fighting seriously, spar or not. Within moments of regaining her bearings, dozens and hundreds of magic circles began to flash in and out of existence behind her in groups as they delivered their charge of frozen projectiles ranging from the size of kitchen knives to spear of ice more than a meter in diameter. On his part, Naruto was blocking them like a champ, using a couple senpo. Chudama Rasengan to essentials grind way whatever she threw at him which was surprisingly easy even when taking into account that the spiraling balls of chakra he was holding were taller than he was and each possessed more energy than the average high-class devil. After over a minute of the continuous barrage, 
he began getting bored of the situation and dismissed the jutsu in his right hand before replacing it with another. Specifically, with a wakusei rasengan, before, for just a moment, he was engulfed in a flaming dark orange aura and flickered from under the icy bombardment to right in front of Grafia. This time though, she was ready. She had prepared her strongest ice shield for deployment at a moment's notice and as soon as he appeared before it formed. And ripped apart by the same centrifugal forces that blasted her further into the sky before, nearly a mile away, she managed to stop her uncontrolled flight and turned to glare at him. In response, though, Naruto cupped his hands together and within gathered a ball of dark crimson, nearly black, energy that sent alarms ringing in her head due to its similarity to her husband's power of destruction. Then, from that larger ball smaller ones began to shoot towards her at blinding speeds and she dodged like hell out of the way of she small rain of pebble-sized attacks. Seconds later, as the seemingly harmless black ball landed across the landscape behind her, she was more than glad that she had chosen to dodge rather than block or deflect when each of those tiny balls exploded with power comparable to the nuclear bombs the humans on Earth were so proud of. I can't hold back anymore. I need to go all out. Grafia realized. Is this what Seraphal meant, that if I don't take him seriously, I'll die? She wondered as she began unleashing her full demonic aura. In everyday life, the vast majority of higher ranked devils kept the majority of their power sealed or on a tight leash to avoid causing discomfort to their weaker kin such as their servant. The process was rather simple, actually. The power of a devil, angel and fallen angel was identified by the number of wings they had, such as seraphs having five pairs and archangels having six pairs. In the case of devils, low-class devils had between one and two pairs, middle-class devils had between two and three pairs, high-class devils had between three and four pairs, and ultimate-class devils had between four and five pairs. Then, of course, were the monsters, the super-devils, those supposedly on par with the progenitor of their race, Satan himself, possessing obscene amounts of demonic power and identified by the six pairs of wings they bore. Since the disappearance of Satan, only three super devils had been born, Ajuka Astaroth and Sirzex Gremory who went on to claim the titles of Beelzebub and Lucifer and Rizavim Levan Lucifer, son of the original Lucifer and Lilith. In her case, Grafia was a proud owner of five pairs of black bat-like wings that she unfurled in steps as the first pair was keeping her afloat. The release of her second pair soothed the wounds she had accumulated, the release of her third and fourth healed those wounds completely and the release of her fifth began freezing the very air around her as her power reached its peak. In response, the blonde across from her grinned in what she could recognize him almost saying, finally, before summoning a pair of bat-like wings himself, making her realize that he had been flying without them so far, without even a magic circle to signify the use of a spell. Wind manipulation, perhaps? Grafia wondered as a second and a third pair of wings followed high class already. She mused, well, what he displayed so far is actually worthy of, ultimate class. She finished her though as a fourth pair unfurled. Then came a fifth making her stiffen as the very air around her came alive, and if she listened carefully she could hear the snarls and growls of various beasts as a pressure began to push on her shoulders. Then, his appearance began to change. First came a shroud of dark orange flame-like energy covering his entire body before it became more solid and became a cloak that reached his ankles, black lines and circles all over it forming some sort of design, the whisker-like marks on his cheeks becoming black bars. His eyes that had become crimson with black cat-like slits then turned to golden orange as ten pitch black orbs emerged from his back. And with that, it was as if her senses had suddenly been muted. She stared at him in incomprehension for a few seconds, since while she could no longer feel his power, she could still see and hear the effects it had on the environment. Then she looked into his golden orange eyes and remembers seeing such eyes in the past. In a yukai. Senjutsu. She realized with trepidation. He was dangerous without it, on my level even, with it. This is something else entirely. Then, his changes continued. First was the darkening of his energy cloak to a dark reed, near black, just like the bombs he had shot at her earlier turning him from a source of illumination to a spot that devoured light. Then, the shape began to change, with horns emerging from his forehead, then tails emerging from his lower back one at a time, apparently made of the same dark red, near black, energy. And with every tail that appeared the pressure on shoulders that made it harder and harder to breathe increased exponentially, the emergence of the fifth tail causing her to pass out and be automatically teleported away. 
As such, she did not witness the emergence of the ninth tail and the sixth pair of devil wings that came with it, nor that of the tenth tail that turned his entire body and shroud into the same black substance as the ten black balls behind him. She did not witness the cataclysm that followed. Observation Room. Watching as Naruto depowered from his strongest form, the four Mao the Ajuka's other five new servants, they were quiet. I've spoken with Naruto and he agreed to keep his status as a super devil secret for the time being. Ajuka ended the silence. He knows that just with becoming my queen he would be getting more attention than he is comfortable with. Add the fact that he is now the new, strongest queen, and he'll probably be hiding his face from the public for months if he can get away with it. Simply being known to be ultimate class is enough for now, since the status as a super devil is not actually a defined category that gives him any perks beyond more attention. I see. Sears X must, inwardly thankful his wife had just passed out from the pressure of the blonde's aura before he had to use some of the immense power to do actual damage to her. I suppose we'll be keeping that knowledge between those of use in this room. Indeed. I will cut the recording when Grafia passed out and Naruto was declared the winner. We can give that to the masses to satisfy their curiosity. Ajuka agreed. No need for them to know that my new queen can turn all of the underworld to rubble if it struck his fancy, he smirked. Should we expect similar performances from you five? Falbium glanced at the shinobi. Sorry, but I've only met four other people in our world holding anything close to that kind of power. Sakura shook her head with more than a little relief. Obito and Madara are dead, Kagaya is sealed and Sasuke is still in the elemental nations. Ah, that's good. One super devil to hide from the other factions will be troublesome enough. Sears X sighed. Not that we're not happy to have him, mind you, but we're trying to build bridges with heaven in the Grigori and suddenly pulling someone like Naruto out of nowhere will cause a lot of noise. Meh. Give it a year or two for people to get used to him existing and being powerful, and he can claim his increase of power was gradual, even encouraging others to train harder. Seraphal scoffed. Well, if that's decided, we have five other assessments to make. Ajuka nodded towards the five shinobi. By comparison, the following fights were rather lackluster. Sure. Shikamaru put up a good fight against McGregor Mathers considering the older man had required the use of two bishop's pieces to reincarnate, what with sinking and traveling between shadows like Naruto had taught him, a trick the blonde had picked up from the toads. And Sakura had ignored the flames emanating Surtur's body and punching him through a mountain. Repeatedly. Not even Hanada and Soji Okita's display of sublime skill and blinking speed matched up, never mind Sai's and Hanabi's fights against Anku and Beowulf respectively, with the shinobi ending their fights by paralyzing their targets either through seals or numbing their bodies through strikes at their pressure points. All in all, the verdict of the day was as followed, Naruto Uzumaki, reincarnated with a mutated queen, super devil in the guise of an ultimate class devil. Shikamaru Nara, reincarnated with bishop, high-class devil. Sakura Haruno, reincarnated with a mutated rook, high-class devil bordering on ultimate class. Hanada Hayuga, reincarnated with one regular knight piece and one mutated knight, high-class devil bordering on ultimate class. Sai, reincarnated with three pawns, middle-class devil. Hanabi Hayuga, reincarnated with two pawns, middle-class devil. Naruto was in a pretty damn good mood. Why wouldn't he? He had just beaten one of the strongest people in the underworld without actually seriously harming them, which would have put him on the top of the shit list of the strongest devil in the underworld, and had gotten promoted the near the top of the food chain, which came with not just a fancy tittle of being ultimate class, which was, admittedly, pretty badass on its own, but also with a very large plot of land. It was nowhere near as big as any of the lands of the remaining pillars of the underworld, true, but with him being the queen of a Mao it was just over twice as large as any ultimate class devil that did not come from a noble family, and those usually received a section of their family's land to control directly rather than neutral, previously unused land like he did. On the plus side, he could build anything he wanted there without worries of messing up something already established. On the other hand, until he created some industry to produce something, he was not earning any money from that land. Not that the blonde Uzumaki had money issues at the moment. Just by being Ajuka's queen, primary lab rat, potential victim, he was getting a steady paycheck that he mostly left in his bank account. However, it had taken all of 10 minutes after Devil Society had been explained to him in broad lines for him to come up with a steady source of income. Namely, the Icha Icha franchise that Jiraiya had left to him. 
having been forced to do essentially nothing strenuous for months in the aftermath of the war against the Akatsuki and their string pullers, in other words no training whatsoever while his prosthetic arm adapted to him fully, Naruto had turned his attention to other matters that had been shelved due to the various emergencies involving the end of the world. The Icha Icha was one of them. Having read the tale of the utterly gutsy shinobi and having coerced into proof reading the third volume of Icha Icha, Naruto was well aware that while Jiraiya was not a bad author, the mistakes he made put off a lot of people that were not interested in only gratuitous porn. So, he took apart all three Icha Icha books and rewrote them in a more cursive and flowing manner while keeping the same level of porn. As he had expected, the book sales for the rewritten Icha Icha were very profitable, and some people were even suggesting he write a fourth volume in the series. In a world where the darker aspects of life as well as the generally intimate ones were at the high of the population's preferences at all times, Naruto was not in the least surprised when the very first volume of Icha Icha earned him in just the month and a half between when he published it and his assessment a small fortune that would let him live comfortable for a year or two. And it would only earn more as time passed, never mind the other two volumes that would be published eventually. Much to his satisfaction, with the earning of the Icha Icha series he was probably set for life or at least a few centuries of it. Which was now a necessity since, after more than a little experimentation, it was determined that there was absolutely no way for them to return home. They had tried every option available, even summoning jutsu, but none worked. Toneri's space-time portal had been meant to be unstable and destroy them in the process of sending them away, that was what Sakura and Ajuka had managed to conclude from analyzing the Otsutsuki's brain. That his death at Hanada's hands had stabilized the portal had been a fluke and that the portal had continued to drain on Toneri's chakra and expand until it had taken the moon with it had been even more unlikely to happen. But happen it did, and despite the near certitude of never returning home they at least had the satisfaction that at least they had stopped the moon from crushing their world. Not that returning home was something they could really do at the moment. Disregarding their debt to Ajuka which they could pay off somehow in due time, which their revelations of various aspects of their world was paying off already at a steady pace, the fact remained that they were no longer human. Even if they somehow found a way home, they would still be devils, they would still have centuries and millennia of life to look forward to while everyone they knew had less than a century to live, some not even a couple decades if they thought of Onoki who was already old as dirt and Tsunade whose regeneration jutsu had shortened her lifespan and prematurely aged her despite her usual appearance might suggest them, though, if Lord and Lady Gremory, the Lucifer's parents, were anything to go by for people older than the Sage of Six Paths, then the reincarnated shinobi had a long life ahead of them. And frankly, for all that saddened him to never again see his friends, to never get the opportunity to become Hokage, Naruto had no intention of moping around. His entire life consisted of obstacles that would break a lesser man and he had overcome them all. If he really sat down and thought about it, his destiny, in the elemental nations had been fulfilled. The Akatsuki was defeated, Madara was dead, Kagaya was sealed, the Biju were free, the world was at peace, and his last act there was to prevent the all world from going splat. A pretty impressive resume, all in all. Now he was a devil. It was a new chapter in his life and he was not going to start things off being broody and Uchiha like. The others were in a similar state, more or less. Sai didn't really care as while he had improved much from his root days, he still considered himself a tool for Konoha deep down. Having ended up stranded in a different world as the price of completing a mission and saving the village was perfectly reasonable to him, and with Ajuka becoming his new master things were pretty good in his life. Shikamaru was somewhat more depressed, being separated from his clan and closest friends Ino and Choji, but as there was nothing to do about it, he got over it and returned to his usual lazy yet genius self doing his best of avoid actually working. Hanada had blamed herself for weak until Hanabi of all people snapped her out of it. In the end, had it not been for her impulsive action, they would be dead rather than just stranded in a different world and functionally immortal. Yes, they would miss their world, but considering how distant the average Hyuga was, never mind the main branch, they would not miss their family that much. Sakura, though, had had it the worst. Being more social amongst them, as well as having both her parents alive, made the sudden separation hurt her the most. In a way, it felt worse than simply dying on a mission since given their situation it was unlikely their souls would go to their world's afterlife when they died, or any afterlife at all, considering that devils were supposedly damned. Surprisingly enough, 
it had been Karama who snapped her out of her funk by poking fun at her until she lost her temper and attacked the fox. The following fight, which obviously ended with the Baiju's overwhelming victory, led to Sakura not only calming down and getting over most of her issues, but the discovery and cementing of her sin, are at least one of them. It was incredible how refreshed she felt after letting out all that accumulated rage, but it made sense once Ajuka explained what really happened and what it meant for them. Devils were creatures of sin. The growth and stability of their power, as well as their mental stability, relied on their indulgence in one or more of the seven deadly sins, wrath, sloth, gluttony, greed, envy, lust and pride. One of Sakura's sins was wrath. That surprised nobody that knew her. Ajuka, however, advised her to find another sin or two to indulge in to reduce he reliance on wrath since overindulging in it would eventually make her too short-tempered to function properly in society. The same went for the other sins, it was better to indulge in several to smaller degrees than in just one utterly. To no one's surprise, Shikamaru's sin was sloth. However, both to keep himself more balanced and as a memento of his Akamichi best friend, he chose gluttony as his secondary sin. For the Hyuga raised Hanabi, pride came as easy as breathing and she chose to temper it with some sloth and envy. In Naruto and Hanada's case, Kurama took matters in his own hands, which meant Naruto and Hanada woke up locked in the same room naked as the day they were born, which gave them an incentive to not only clear whatever misunderstandings had plagued and troubled them during their last mission, but also cement their primary sin as lust, and their probably secondary as greed given that they did not leave that room for while even after they discovered they could. Now though, they had adapted to the basics of devil life in the underworld, and with their assessment over, four of them would be receiving their own sets of evil pieces so they could form their own peerages. There were several ways that this event normally occurred. In the case of noble families, which had high levels of demonic power due to their genetics, the children commonly received their evil pieces at age 10 which was the average age when pure-blooded devils from noble families reached a level of demonic power that classified them as high class, thus enabling them to use the evil pieces without issue. Depending on the family, they could either receive a set of evil pieces and bind to them on their own in privacy or, if the family possessed demonic power that held special properties, Ajuka regulated the way they channeled their power into the evil pieces in order to potentially confer higher affinities for the eventual receivers of those evil pieces to the magics of those specific families. For regular pure-blooded devils that simply managed to advance in rank to high class despite being born amongst the lower ranks, Ajuka simply provided them with their sets once they were awarded high class and left them to bind the pieces to them and themselves to the system by connecting with the King Peace Monument in Lilith, their capital. For reincarnated devils, though, things were often more complicated which in Ajuka's view made them more interesting. For one thing, Unlike with pure-blooded devils who were awarded high-class status once they had accumulated the standard amount of demonic power to maintain the evil pieces, reincarnated devils needed to spend a period of time proving themselves, both in their worth and their loyalty to their master and government, before they would be awarded high-class status in addition to having the standard amount of demonic power for high-class devils. As such, more often than not, by the time the usually pro-pure-blood government deemed them worthy enough, the reincarnated high-class devils had too much power for a standard binding to evil pieces to work. Also, given the trend of reincarnating not only regular humans but sacred gear users and other races like Yukai that carried specific abilities in their genes, it required the assistance of Ajuka to bind the evil pieces to them, much to his satisfactions due to the various interesting results he at times got. In the case of the shinobi, it was a given that they would require assistance in binding a set of evil pieces to themselves not only due to their individual abilities such as Shikamaru's shadow manipulation and the Hyuga's Byakugan, but their chakra circulatory systems themselves set them apart from all other devils, reincarnated or not. No race in this world possessed a chakra circulatory system. The source of magic and supernatural power in general in this world was the soul itself. While ordinary, powerless humans simply had ordinary souls, those with power, human or otherwise, had variations of a secondary circulatory system growing from their soul and bridging the gap to their bodies. Unlike the chakra circulatory system, the magic circuits, as they were called, were more expansive similar to a person's nervous system and carried only mana, the source of magic, in the case of humans, with devils having a darker variation called demonic power and angels fallen or not having angelic power, and so on. What the evil pieces did, in addition to biologically giving a person devil traits, was to convert the reincarnated person's soul to that of a devil as well as their energy. 
More so, the reincarnation process triggered not only the activation of all dormant magic circuits, but also the artificial creation of more depending on what evil piece was used on them. With the circuits holding various properties, some being of high quality and quantity to give bishops more mana to work with, some allowing the enhancing of speed to give knights increased agility, some allowing the enhancing of endurance and strength to give rooks more resilience and power, and some allowing all three for queens, while pawns had a more variable system that had limits on how long one ability could be sustained. In the shinobi, though, the evil pieces had no already present magic circuits to awaken or convert, so they had to fulfill their function by creating them from scratch. Once the amount of magic circuits deemed necessary for their hosts had been created, the pieces had then moved on to the physical transformation to devil physiology which led to the enhancement of their bodies beyond their already superhuman limits. These two steps had far greater results on shinobi than they would on humans of their new world. The creation of magic circuits meant increasing their reserves of yin chakra which was the same thing as mana despite flowing through different conduits. The physical enhancement, on the other hand, meant increasing their reserves of yang chakra and its potency. It was only after those two steps that the evil pieces went on with their other tasks, converting the soul and its energy into that of a devil and forming a connection to their master, in this case a juka, which went without a hitch. In the end, though, the bottom line was that the benefits they received from being reincarnated into devils were at least three times greater on average when they would have been on a talented human on earth that would necessitated the same evil pieces used on them. So Ajuka wanted very much to see if the trait of having chakra circulatory systems would be passed down at least to some extent through their evil pieces to their future servants. The device that facilitated a more complete binding of the evil pieces to their master was rather large but structurally rather simple. It was basically a crystal sphere around 30 meters in diameter, it had used to be much smaller, but with dragons and other large creatures becoming devils and reaching high class, a larger one had become necessary which was connected to a smaller one in which the blank evil pieces were placed in a computer monitoring and regulating the energy flow between the two. The process was rather simple, really, hence why outside special circumstance high-class devils could do the binding on their own. They poured some of their fresh blood over the blank pieces and then entered the larger crystal sphere where they would unleash their strongest form and flare their power until they were nearly exhausted. The released power would flow to the sphere holding the pieces and into them absorbing the blood as a conduit, and once the flow of power stopped become attuned to the devil. The purpose of the computer was to ensure the process went on smoothly and that the pieces had been bound fully to their masters. Shikamaru had gone first and as a result of him putting nearly all his demonic power and chakra into them, his evil pieces were a pitch black that absorbed light, one of his pawns even being a mutated piece. While statistically mutated pieces appeared in 1 out of 10 devils when they bound their set to them, there were ways to predict their appearance. For one thing, it was a near certain thing that when the king had reserves of demonic power far above average high class devils, one of their evil pieces would be a mutated piece. Another factor was the properties of the devil's demonic power, such as potency. Generally, the system distributed the power equally between the pieces during the binding process, so even if someone like a super devil was the one doing it, not all his pieces were mutated despite their worth being far greater than those of other devils. It was peculiarities like special properties of the demonic powers or even personality quirks of the devil that caused the mutation. In the end, what made mutated pieces special was that they were worth more than the average piece of the same type in the same set. After all, it was ridiculous to compare the worth of the mutated pawn piece of an average high class devil with a regular pawn piece of a super devil or even just an ultimate class devil. Sakura's turn led to the creating of a set of green evil pieces, the exhaustion of all the chakra she had accumulated in her yin seal leading to not one but two of her pieces being mutated, a bishop and a rook. Hanada's results were even more spectacular, as with her unleashing Hamura's chakra in addition to her own, her evil pieces ended up a melding of cyan and purple. The number of mutated evil pieces also drew the eye. Both bishops and three pawns were mutated. Of course, Naruto had to top that. While the unleashing of his final form had shaken Ajuka's lab something fierce, the maelstrom of orange, red and black power that came out of him was nevertheless channeled fully into his new evil pieces turning them a solid dark orange with red and black accents. And every last one of them was mutated. Ajuka was not in the least surprised. 
while he himself got about a third of his pieces mutated when he bound a new set to him and Sirzex would likely get half of them in the same state now should he need other pieces than his original ones, that was to be expected given their power levels as well as the peculiarities of their demonic power, their Kankara formula and power of destruction respectively. By comparison, Naruto had just as much if not more raw power, and more peculiarities than the two of them combined given his powerful affinities to all five basic elements of fire, water, earth, lightning and wind, the opposing two, yin and yang, and several affinities generally restricted to bloodlines like lava, boil, magnet, scorch, and ink elements that he got from the melding of Biju Chakra with his own. After recovering their energy and a quick teleportation to Lilith to bind them to the King Monument as part of the system, Ajuka took them back to his estate. Specifically, to a room Naruto had been visiting daily. The Biju or titanic living forms of tainted chakra, some like the Kyubi actually called living masses of hatred due to how tainted their chakra is. The reason was rather simple, due to them being both incarnations of nature itself as once part of the Shinju as well as having at their origin the chakra of the countless humans bound to the roots of the Shinju and drained of their chakra, the Biju not only absorbed natural energy in the process of refilling their reserves and recoalescing should they be killed, but also the emotions carried in the chakra human release in nature. Having lived for a millennium in a world always at war with itself, it was only natural that the predominant emotions in the natural chakra in the world were negative, hence what the biju absorbed. Now, Karama was in hell. Not hell proper, but the underworld, the uppermost and technically separate portion of hell. That did not change the fact that demonically tainted energy saturated the atmosphere. And with the portion of it inside Naruto being permanented converted and assimilated, the process of regenerating that portion of power was put in motion by drawing on the ambient energy which was all too easy to draw in. And with it hatred and malice beyond anything Karama had ever felt in its long life. It had been a stroke of luck that they had found the Kyubi in time and teleported the Biju to an isolated chamber, but the fact remained that the ambient energy of the underworld was too dark even for Karama to safely absorb. The idea of going to the human word while he recuperated was tossed around and then quickly abandoned when Ajuka told them how whether it was on earth or the underworld, Senjutsu users had to fight to keep their sanity against the malice that had become part of the natural energy. Kurama had reasoned that had it been just using Senjutsu, he could have handled it since he could have limited how much he took in and at what rate, allowing him to filter at least some of the malice. A theory Naruto put to the test and proved by entering not only six paths sage mode but also his new true form while retaining perfect control over himself. Yes, his energy in that state was darker but it did not mess with his head. The blonde sage had even gone ahead and proven that he could purify the energy he took in and then release it back into the atmosphere, which led to him helping along Karama's recovery by taking in natural energy from the outside, purifying it, and then visiting Karama and releasing that energy in the isolation room. Unfortunately, due to the underworld and earth not having natural chakra users, the ambient energy was rather weak and yin orientated so they were not making much progress like that. The answer to the problem was surprisingly simple. Have Naruto turn Karama into a devil? It was often that those that were to be reincarnated into devils had received fatal wounds or even already died. In the process of healing and reviving them, the king was able to supplement the power of the evil piece with their own by maintaining direct skin to skin contact. Only one problem remained, however, a biju was a being of pure chakra. They usually coalesced into a solid form, yes, but they were still chakra. The closest thing they had for comparison were ghosts, which freaked Naruto out something fierce, and those were impossible to reincarnate as they were well and truly dead. So, Kurama needed a physical body or at least some genetic material for the evil piece to use in the creation of at least a pseudo body since while closest to a ghost, Kurama was made of chakra living energy, thus very much alive. For this, Ajuka provided the preserved blood of a nine-tailed fox yukai named Kurama, and went on to explain the story behind it and the other yukai that were famous enough for even humans not aware of the supernatural to have heard of those literary works, which interested the biju and the shinobi greatly as the coincidence of those yukai bearing the same names as the biju was too much to ignore. Ajuka had obtained samples from them and other powerful yukai capable of practicing senjutsu under the promise of not forcing anyone into it or performing unethical experiments on yukai in his research on the subject. His results were rather unsatisfactory though, and he hoped that with Naruto and maybe even Kurama's help he would make more progress in the future. 
which led to Naruto pouring the blood on Kurama after pushing some of his fur aside on the Baiju's balai and then implanting his mutated queen piece through that spot, before setting down to take a nap right on top of it, buck naked, allowing the Kyubi to draw as much energy as he needed from him, as with his reserves now comparable to those of the Jubi, there was no actual danger of him running out. And as an added precaution, a few of his cage bunshin were keeping an eye on the situation and ready to gather sage chakra to transfer to him should he get low. Still, whatever he was expecting when he went to sleep, Naruto most certainly did not expect to wake up on top of a busty red-haired red-eyed woman who eerily resembled his mother despite the crimson fox ears peeking from the top of her head and the nine fluffy fox tails of the same color connected to her tailbone. Who was also buck naked? Brat. The Kashina lookalike, who could only be Kurama, blinked blearily as she woke up to see him peeking at her with wide eyes from where his face was resting into her generous cleavage. Well, I can now say with certitude that the genetic material used will not affect what the eventual gender of Baiju's transformation into a devil would be. Ajuka remarked blandly as he looked curiously at the feminized Kurama. How did you figure that? The Kiyubi snarked. The Kurama of this world is 100% male. Ajuka replied. Now you're just rubbing it in. Kurama twitched. Also, from what Naruto has told me and the memories he had provided, Ajuka continued. Nice tech, by the way. The blonde muttered absently as he stared at his former tenant. We can state that a biju is likely to take the form of one of its former hosts. The Mao paused, or an approximation of it, anyway. He shrugged. Approximation? So Kurama's body is not identical with that of Kashina Uzumaki, Shikamaru frowned. Indeed. I can tell a few features come from Mito Uzumaki as well, from the memories Kurama herself has provided. Ajuka confirmed. Neither Mito nor Kashina had such large breasts though. Kurama protested as she groped his generous bust. From what I remember, even after giving birth a couple times Mito only had a low C cup and at the time of her death Kashina had a high D cup. These things are. What size are they again? For one, I'm surprised you even knew that much regarding your host's measurements. Sakura pointed out in disbelief. And those are J cups. Your exact bust waist hips measurements are 107, 61, 95, at 175 centimeters of height and 65 kilograms of weight. HMPH, I had to spend decades with nothing but pointless female chatter to listen to. Kurama scoffed. Well, pointless or not, your breasts are actually bigger than Lady Tsunade's. Sakura grumbled with unconcealed jealousy. Personally, Hanabi spoke up, I'm more curious why Ajuka-sama keeps referring to the biju in general rather than Kurama-san in particular. It's not like more of the biju came with us. There was a pause as everyone turned to look at the green-haired Mao. Right? Hanabi insisted. Ahem, funny that you mentioned that, Ajuka chuckled rather sheepishly. What did you do? Kurama demanded. Well, remember when you told me that your chakra inside Naruto was being converted into his own? hence why you chose to not return into the seal. Ajuka began, earning a nod from the red head. Well, I then thought that I should keep an eye on that so I set some devices to monitor the conversion, and discovered eight other presences other than your own inside Naruto that were in danger of disappearing if left alone. You extracted the chakra of the other biju inside me. Naruto frowned in confusion. No, that can't be right. If that had happened, I would not be able of using six paths sage mode and the Gudadama. I extracted around half of each. Ajuka corrected. And stored them in isolated containers. I was curious in seeing what were the similarities with the souls sealed inside certain sacred gears, but with Kurama's condition becoming apparent it was obvious that that similarities were only superficial so I didn't even start any work on them. Can I see them? Kurama asked though it was spoken more like a demand. Sure. But they're not able to converse as they are. Ajuka motioned for them to follow and led them to another isolation chamber within which eight two-meter-wide spheres stood, containing masses of crimson chakra only vaguely shaped as the biju. They don't have enough energy to fully materialize and exposing them to the ambient energy has proven to be a bad idea in Kurama's case. I can give them some of my chakra to help them along. Kurama absently spoke as she approached the closest sphere which held the nanabi. See the magic circle on the ground? That's the isolation boundary. Ajuka explained. Simply push an arm or something beyond it and channel your chakra through it. In response, Kurama pushed a handful of her tails onto the sphere and unleashed a healthy amount of her crimson chakra into it, 
and within a few minutes Chome had become physical, if a lot smaller than before. Ah! Uh, where am it, Karama? Is that you? The Nanabi turned towards the red head in disbelief. Your chakra feels darker but. Yeah, it's me. Karama grumbled. I'll let Naruto explain while I help out the rest of our kin. She decided and moved on to the next biju. Time skip. Three hours later, so basically, Naruto wants to turn us into hookers? Shukaku asked after the long explanation was over. Who the fuck are you calling a hooker, you fucking sand rat? Karama snarled. Remember your place, Shukaku. If it wasn't for me, you'd still be just formless chakra. And no, it's unlikely that you would all become female. Ajuka spoke up undisturbed by the killing intent the Kiyubi was throwing around. It will likely depend on the forms of your past hosts and your personal preferences. So Karama wanted to be a woman? Shikamaru asked doubtfully. Actually, I think it's because he saw a lot of itself in the strong and temperamental woman Kashina Uzumaki was, from what Naruto has shared with us, Ajuka replied. Noises of comprehension and understanding accompanied this revelation. Well, I doubt I could be turned into a woman even if I had a particular preference for it. All my Jinchuriki were male. Yuki muses, not at all upset about it. Same here. Shukaku added. All my hosts were female. Matabi spoke up. They were hoping that any children my hosts would give birth to would inherit some of my power. It did not end well for them. Before what gender you could take even matters, are you all sure you want to do this? It's not something to change your minds about later. Shikamaru pointed out. Why not? Yuki shrugged. We would basically have a new lease on life. In the elemental nations, there was always the danger of some new cage deciding they wanted to reinstate the Jinchuriki system. The possibility exists here as well if we remain as we are. If we become devils though, we would be able to fit in. Not to mention that it would take forever to get back to full size the way we are now. Isobu grumbled. Do you all agree? Naruto inquired and received determined nods, well, all right then. Naruto nodded. I'll start with Gyuki and then Chome and so on. Hey, why can't you star with me? Shukaku demanded. Because he wants to make sure he uses his more valued evil pieces on those that require a bigger price first. Ajuka explained. If he were to reincarnate you and Matabi with his rooks, it is likely he will not have enough pieces left to reincarnate Chome and Gyuki. That means I'll be a pawn. Shukaku concluded. Worth several pawn pieces. Ajuka agreed. Do not underestimate the pawn piece. I created it for a reason, after all. You will be able to switch between having great strength and resilience, great speed and great magic power. That would work well with your skill set, from what I've heard, he pointed out. Hum, fine. Shukaku grumbled, seeing the point. He also understood that someone other than Naruto could reincarnate him instead, but that would mean no longer being together with his siblings and as much as he whined about them, he did not desire the separation. They were made together and they would remain together with Naruto. It will take hours, maybe even a few days for the process for even one of you to be complete. Ajuka warned. It only took the night for Karama because it already had more than four-fifths of its power. You all, on the other hand, each have less than a tenth of your original power. Time skip. Two months later two months, that was how long it took for Naruto to reincarnate all the biju. The transformation of each lasted as many days as they had tails, and Ajuka insisted Naruto take three days break after each. Not that he was doing nothing while he was cooped up in the isolation chambers. Much to his displeasure, he was forced to study. There was only so much time Ajuka could set aside to spend with them each day, away from his duties and his experiments, so the recently reincarnated Shinobi and Biju had to use other sources of information. Thankfully, Ajuka's library was open to them for perusal and it soon became a common sight for them to laze around the Baiju's isolation chamber reading. As much as some of them, Naruto and Kurama, would have wanted to skip straight to learning how to blow stuff up with magic. The fact remained that beyond the basics they knew nothing of devil society and history, never mind the other supernatural factions in the human world. It had been an admittedly amusing experience when some of the other Mao dropped by to visit. Flashback. Come now, Ajuka. Sirzex was complaining. You've finally got some more lively servants and you're making them study. Let them live a little. Need I remind you that they know absolutely nothing of not only the supernatural, but the human world as well? Ajuka drawled as he led the group towards the isolation chamber. All work and no play makes boring devils, Ajuka-chan. 
Seraphal pointed out. It's not like I'm forcing them to study. Ajuka sighed as he stopped by the door. They realize themselves how in over their heads they are and are trying to catch up. Besides, there are health issues to be taken into account. Are they ill? Sirzex frowned. No, but the peerage members Naruto has chosen to reincarnate have seen better days and it will take a while longer before they are all back to 100%. Ajuka shrugged. Given that this is an isolation chamber, should we assume whatever they have is contagious? Grafia asked warily. No, it's the other way around. They are particularly weak to the atmosphere of the underworld so we're keeping them isolated until their transition to devilhood has finalized. Ajuka corrected as he opened the door and led them inside. There were several people present, all of them occupied either with books or various folders of reports ranging from medical to mining. Sakura was going through several medical texts, Hinata was staring intently at a balloon in her arm that popped and was replaced with another from the large pile next to her. Sai and an unknown black man with pale blonde hair wearing sunglasses were focusing on something they were writing with ink and brushes. Hanabi was going through law books. Shikamaru was intently studying an old book on the uses of the darkness element while next to him were a few others on the same subject as well as the shadow and light elements. A tan-skinned teenage girl with orange eyes and mint hair was reading a book on familiars. A very busty red-haired woman with slit crimson eyes was reading some reports on Yukai. And all around the place were hundreds of Naruto's reading various materials. Hey, you have some guests. Ajuka called for their attention. Hum? Oh, the Leviathan, the Lucifer and his queen. One of the clones glanced at them. What's up? He waved casually. Ajuka, we've talked about this. Sirzex sighed, closing his eyes and pinching the bridge of his nose as he felt a major headache coming. Sirzex, Ajuka began. As much as you like one person, and as useful they may be, there are lines not even us devils should cross. Sirzex continued. Cloning is one of them. But, Ajuka tried. Even without the moral implications, just think how the rest of the underworld will react when they hear about this. Everyone will want one. We can't just hand out super devils to, Sirzex ranted on. Sirzex. Ajuka shouted, losing his patience. What? The redhead snapped. It's just one of Naruto's techniques. The clones are temporary. One solid hit will dispel them. Ajuka explained dryly. Oh. Sirzex blinked. Or, sorry to have doubted you, Ajuka. He chuckled nervously. Whatever. Ajuka shook his head, deciding not to mention that he was looking into the possibility of making those cage bunshin last longer at the very least, if not make them semi-permanent. With Naruto's knowledge and help, of course. Where's the original? He asked the nearest clone who was watching them with amusement. He's still at it with Saiken. He should be done by tonight, I think. The clone waved towards what looked like a massive gooey white blob. Approaching it. It became clear that the blob was actually a giant slug with six tail like appendages at its rear end. This is disgusting. Grafia grimaced. Well, fuck you, lady. Nobody asked for your opinion. One of the eye stalks turned to glare at her. It can talk. Sirzex blinked curiously. This is Saiken, Naruto's soon to be bishop. Ajuka explained. As well as the Rokubi Biju. Come again? Seraphal blinked. Didn't you say only Karama Chan was sealed in Narukun? Well, actually, all the Biju left a piece of them inside him. And since it's only a piece, it's taking a long time to transform them into devils. Ajuka explained. The red haired woman, the black skinned man, and the mint haired girl you might have seen earlier are the Kiyubi, Hachibi, and Nanabi. That is Karama, Yuki, and Chome, respectively. Becoming devils gave them human like bodies as well. I, see. Sirzex mused. Well, glad to have you aboard. Where is Naruto thought? He asked Saiken. On top of me. He's currently taking a nap. Want to leave a message? Saiken replied. No, that won't be necessary. Sirzex is just bored and wants to do something entertaining with Naruto. Ajuka scoffed. Try being sealed for decades in someone's gut. Then, you'll know real boredom. Saiken scoffed. If you need Naruto for something outside combat, one of his clones should be enough. I'll keep that in mind. Sirzex chuckled sheepishly and led the others away. Any other surprise you want to spring on us, Ajuka? He asked dryly. Karama is also a super devil. Ajuka took pleasure at the look on Sirzex's face. It appears that the ninth tail is equivalent with the power of a super devil, 
hence why with the release of his ninth tail Naruto's sixth pair of wings emerged. What about the others? The Hachibi, Gyuki, was it? Is the next one in terms of power, right? Grafia spoke up. No, Gyuki has roughly half of Kurama's power though from there on the power difference between the Biju begins to shrink. Ajuka mused. From what I understand, this sage of six paths that created the nine Biju first split the chakra of the Jubi in two, using half to create Kurama. Then he split in two once more, using half of that to create Gyuki. From there on he used a different method. So while having a tail more than the next signifies a biju is the stronger one, it's no longer a sign of being twice as strong as the top tier biju, he explained. Does that mean that since Naru kun has ten tails in his true form, he's twice as strong as Karama chan? Seraphal inquired. Most likely. Ajuka nodded slowly. That would mean that combined, Naruto Uzumaki's peerage will have the power equivalent of four super devils. Grafia pointed out with trepidation. Likely more, since he will still have a few pawns left over after reincarnating the biju, Ajuka remarked. How do we know they will not turn on us in favor of say, the Yukai faction? Grafia asked quietly. No, I can say that the chances of that happening are near zero. What you need to understand about them is that if there's one thing they hate, it's traitors. Ajuka said with certainty. If we don't betray them, then we have no reason to worry about them doing so. Then I guess there's nothing to worry about. Sirzex relaxed. As for the Yukai faction, Ajuka grimaced. They have read up on the Nekomata incident. He revealed causing the others to react similarly, and while they are admittedly displeased with how we dealt with it, they are downright furious with how the Yukai faction did nothing to protect their own. I see. Sirzex muttered. I wonder if they feel like I did when I found out father's greed got the better of him and he engaged Rias to the youngest son of the Phoenix clan, he grumbled. At any rate, it will take a few more weeks for Naruto to finish reincarnating the Biju, so stop whining and sew some real work for a change, Ajuka told him flatly. Flashback end now though, the nine Biju were assembled under their new king, the unofficial second Jubi, Naruto Uzumaki, and they were all rather bored. The fact was, Ajuka spent the majority of his time in his labs and while Shikamaru, Sakura, Sai and even Hanada could live with that and work on their own research projects to better the underworld, Hanabi and especially Naruto and his peerage could not do that. Or rather, they were unwilling to do so. While discussing what they could do with their time now that they were decently caught up regarding the underworld and the supernatural world as a whole, Ajuka's attempts at sacred gears came up. What are sacred gears, really? Naruto spoke up. I mean, they were mentioned in various texts and we know the god of the Bible made them, but. Hum, let me explain then. Ajuka mused. Sacred gears, also known as God's artifacts, are items with powerful abilities bestowed upon humans by the biblical God. They are part of his system of enacting miracles to help humanity. Sacred gears were created at some point during the latter half of the Great War when God realized just how much damage was being inflicted upon the human world, as well as how little he could do to personally reduce that damage. Ajuka smirked slightly. You see, between leading Heaven's war effort, creating new angels to replenish Heaven's ranks, and keeping the other factions out of our war, God was quite busy, too busy to properly focus on the humans he was sworn to protect and whom he had falsely claimed to have created. So he created sacred gears so they could protect themselves, Shikamaru deduced. Indeed. Not only did this allow human to pose some resistance worth noticing against those that attacked them, but with the sacred gears the humans affiliated with the church could actively participate in the war on the side of heaven. More than that, with sacred gears appearing randomly in humans, Christianity gained footholds in regions of the world where other religions reigned supreme, subverting more and more follower. It's no wonder that Christianity is today's number one religion. Can you be a bit more specific regarding sacred gears? Sakura requested. Certainly. Ajuka agreed. For one thing, I can tell you that they can appear in those who are only part human rather than just pure-blooded humans. They have various powers, there's probably one for each type of magic out there. There are also multiple copies of the majority of sacred gears, only the thirteen called the Longinus class that have the potential of killing a god being unique though there exist weaker variations of some of them. He explained before taking a sip of water to wet his dry throat. As for their general abilities, sacred gears can also adapt and evolve based on their wielder's thoughts, needs, and feelings, gaining abilities or qualities as time passes. 
This is believed to be the source of Balance Breaker, and suggested to be the source of the transformation into a subspecies. Balance Breaker. Subspecies. Karama frowned. Sacred gears have an ultimate state of activation called the Balance Breaker, which is the most powerful manifestation of the sacred gear. Once reached, the Balance Breaker can be entered again far more easily than the first time. Ajuka explained. Reaching the Balance Breaker can be triggered by the feelings of its possessor. Balance Breaker is said to be have been never intended, and that it was a flaw in the system created by God. He paused. As for subspecies, they are sacred gears that have taken on a unique characteristic because of the thoughts and feelings of the wielder. They are more powerful than the normal form of the same sacred gear, and will sometimes gain a new ability as well. Sometimes, both the sacred gear in its normal state, as well as the balance breaker will be a subspecies. Other times, however, only the balance breaker will be a subspecies. What about their composition? What are they made of? Shikamaru inquired. That depends on the sacred gear in question. Ajuka chuckled. While some manifest as weapons and armor, or jewelry, others appear just as abilities attached to part of the user's body, like the eyes for instance. But if you're asking about the core, it's a crystal within which the essence of the sacred gear itself is sealed in the form of energy despite having a physical form while in use. In fact, there are plenty of sacred gears that have living creatures sealed inside them, the most famous of them being amongst the Longinus, with boosted gear having Diedrig, the Red Dragon Emperor and one of the Heavenly Dragons, which the Divine Dividing having Albion, the White Dragon Emperor and the other Heavenly Dragon. Then there is also the Regulus Nemea which contains the spirit of the Lion King, the Nemean Lion Regulus, residing within it. And how did these creatures end up being sealed in sacred gears? Karama scowled, drawing parallels to the situation of the Bijou. I can't tell you how it was for all of them, but the most famous examples, the heavenly dragons, tend to speak for themselves. Ajuka said dryly. Specifically, those two battle maniacs, Diedrig and Albion, have been the source of disaster all over the world throughout history. Whenever they met, they fought causing natural disasters and in some cases destroying entire civilizations. In fact, the Great War was actually put on hold and the three biblical factions teamed up to take them out when they suddenly began fighting in the middle of our battlefield, not paying any attention to the tens of thousands that got killed simply from the backlash of their attacks. In the end, they were killed and the biblical gods sealed their souls in what became the boosted gear and the divine dividing. Even now, those two dragons project their rivalry into their wielders, those who survive activation, anyway. Survive activation? I don't like the sound of that. Hanada frowned. Sacred gears of great power like the Thirteen Longinus put a certain strain on the user's body. Ajuka explained. Take the boosted gear and the divine dividing as examples. The boosted gear doubles the power of the wielder every ten seconds, but that does not mean the body of the user can handle that power. And since most activations are due to strong emotions like in battle, they won't realize their body is breaking down before it's too late to stop it. With the divine dividing the user halves the enemy's power and absorbs it into themselves. Imagine how a normal human would react to having half the power of even just a low-class stray devil suddenly forced in them. Kinda like a Jinchuriki using too much of their Baiju's chakra, only without the regeneration factor to keep them together. Naruto grimaced, thinking of his initial experiences of using more than four tails of Karama's chakra. Because of this, it is rather rare for humans who were previously unaware to the supernatural to survive the activation of their sacred gear. Ironically, the highest number of sacred gear users number amongst reincarnated devils since the increase in durability ensures the safe use of their gears, and quite a few high-class devils specifically seek out sacred gears users, either with active or dormant gears, to add to their peerage. Ajuka revealed. So, when you get down to it, sacred gears are crystals with something sealed inside them, ranging from physical objects to rare spells to souls of living creatures. Hanabi summarized. Indeed. Ajuka confirmed before Hanabi changed the subject to magic. Unseen by them, Shikamaru and Naruto exchanged calculative looks. Time skip. Two months later it had been of some difficulty, but they had found one. Not necessarily because stay devils possessing sacred gears were rare, on the contrary, a good quarter of the strays out there held a sacred gear of some kind and had defected either because they had been tricked or reincarnated into devils against their will or, more common, 
they got it into their heads that because they had sacred gears they were chosen by God or other such reason to think themselves superior and thus saw it beneath them to follow the orders of their king. The reason why it had taken them so long to track down astray with a sacred gear was twofold. On the one hand, after two months of essentially laying low, it was expected of them to make appearances with Ajuka at various events, more often than not being ordered to go in the Mao's place as he was not overly fond of parties and now he had the opportunity of passing the buck to Naruto and his other servants. It came as quite a surprise to the other shinobi that yes, Naruto could be polite to nobles even if he would like nothing more than kick their arrogant asses, and yes, he did no etiquette even if he showed literally no sign of it back in the elemental nations. When asked after his first baffling performance, he explained that during his three years on the road with Jiraiya he had passed through the palaces of more than half of the daimyo in the elemental nations and Jiraiya had drilled into his head how to act around nobles after explaining to the temperamental blonde that if the nobles got pissed off. Konoha could end up as bad as Suna economically, if not worse, thus Naruto learned to bite his tongue and smile at some of the most arrogant bastards in the elemental nations who wasted more money before breakfast than it would take to keep a large family fed for a year. The reason why he did not bother with such an act around shinobi. Simple. Shinobi respected power and conviction, not pretty words and ass kissing. The other reason why it took them so long. They wanted a sacred gear that would fit the fighting style of one of the shinobi. Specifically, the sacred gear knight reflection had shadow manipulation abilities and would work perfectly for Shikamaru if they managed to obtain it and implant it into the Nara. They tracked down one Arzolig Marshios in Panama and after a short battle involving Shikamaru binding it with his shadows and Naruto overpowering the newly learned basic thunderbolt spell into frying and temporarily paralyzing Arzolig, rendering him unconscious. Okay. Let's see if this works. I don't want to have wasted weeks of going through sighting reports for this bastard. Shikamaru sighed. Hold your horses, I'm getting to it. Naruto grumbled as he climbed on the massive devil's reptile-like torso and after activating his chakra cloak over his arms he reached inside, phasing through, and began to feel for the sacred gear's crystal core. Finding something, he pulled it out revealing a purplish bishop evil piece. Ups. Naruto muttered before shrugging and placing it in his pocket. Another bishop later and he was getting annoyed when he finally found it, pulling out a black crystal the size of his fist surrounded in a black aura. Jackpot. He grinned. Now hand over those bishops to me already. Shikamaru rolled his eyes at his whiskered friend's enthusiasm and caught the two pieces thrown his way, immediately setting to work. What he was doing was simple in theory but complex in practice. He was removing a good chunk of the programming inside the two bishops that allowed the two crystals to serve in the reincarnation and empowerment of people into devils. He could do this thanks to over a month of going over Ajuka's notes and watching the Mao personally create dozens of evil pieces of each type. Then he tossed them back to Naruto who held them between his cupped hands and soon enough within an orb of his demonic biju chakra. Slowly but surely, the two bishops lost their form and merged into a single blob which he shaped into a perfect sphere before withdrawing the chakra and inspecting the results carefully and having Shikamaru double check. It looks as expected. Go for the next step. The Nara advised. Nodding in agreement. Naruto once again surrounded the purplish sphere in his biju chakra but this time it was held in just one hand. The other held the core of the sacred gear knight reflect in the same manner. Over the course of the next ten minutes, the purplish orb darkened and began radiating a dark aura similarly to the sacred gear, at which point Naruto stopped. The change was temporary, though, and without something to maintain it, it would fade within the hour. Which was why Shikamaru was unfurling a large scroll with a complex ceiling array on it. Naruto casually used his monstrous strength to push the still unconscious stray devil onto a portion of the scroll while he placed the transformed crystal sphere on a specific spot before activating the array. As they had expected, the devil woke up but did not have time for more than a single scream of agony before the entirety of his life force and soul were consumed and sealed permanently into the now pitch black sphere giving off a dark demonic aura that yet lacked actual malice, leaving behind a husk that shattered into dust on its own. Well, what do you think? Shikamaru inquired. I think we can call it a success. Naruto mused as he picked up crystal sphere and formed a connection with it using his chakra. Throw a kanai at me. He asked and seconds later a black shield erupted from the sphere, absorbed the kanai and shot it back towards the side. Yep, it works as expected. 
Shikamaru smiled as he pulled out a containment scroll and sealed away both crystal spheres before activating the teleportation spell and taking them home. Where an annoyed Ajuka was waiting for them. Exactly what were you two doing messing with two bishop evil pieces? The Mao demanded angrily. We made a hell gear. Naruto quickly replied. What? Ajuka blinked. I thought we were going to call it a demonic armament. Shikamaru frowned. Too long and not catchy enough. The blonde rebuffed. True. How about a compromise? Shikamaru offered. A devil arm. Oh. I like the sound of that. Naruto agreed. Wait, wait, back up here, Ajuka exclaimed. We made a demonic equivalent of a sacred gear. Shikamaru explained as he unsealed both crystal spheres and handing them over to his boss. The one in your right is the sacred gear while the one in your left is the devil arm. Feel free to analyze them as much as you want, just make sure to have someone seal the sacred gear in a scroll to make sure heaven doesn't recycle it into another user. Now, if you excuse us, we've been out hunting that bastard for more than two days straight. We need to get some sleep. Naruto yawned as he and Shikamaru headed to their respective bedrooms leaving behind the Beelzebub who had already begun analyzing both the sacred gear and the newly named Devil Arm. The creation of the first Devil Arm had far-reaching consequences on the policies of the underworld. The very next day, the four Mao convened with the Shinobi and the Biju where Shikamaru and Naruto explained what they did and how. To say that the rest were surprised that the two had essentially recycled the evil pieces inside the stray devil was an understatement. All the Mao, even Ajuka, had long since given up on recovering any of the high-quality crystals used in the creation of evil pieces. Not because there were no others who could subdue and extract the evil pieces, there were plenty of strays who had a priority capture order on them instead of elimination for various reasons, more often than because they held valuable information, but because even after being extracted and deprogrammed, the vast majority of the crystals were still tightly connected to the stray and held their essence even after death preventing the use on others. But here Naruto could not only purge the connection to the strays, but also had a method of using the strays themselves as a power source to finalize the transition from evil piece into devil arm. And, after a brief explanation of what he had done, the Biju and Hanada declared that they were near certain they could replicate the process themselves. A few of the shinobi, namely Sakura and Hanada, were somewhat aghast at the idea of sacrificing the souls of the strays like that, but Ajuka was quick to explain to them that the result of a normal death would be much the same. The secret of reincarnating people into devils was that by human standards, devils did not classify fully as living beings, the same rule applying for angels and fallen angels. With angels having been created by God to live in heaven, they and those that fell or evolved from them were primarily spiritual beings. The truth behind the long, near immortal lives of devils, angels and fallen angels was that what they were living was actually a mix of their lives and afterlives, hence why with their deaths they did not go to the afterlife but simply disappeared. Natural reincarnation was limited to very few, only a few cases being acknowledged as real, with the people reincarnated having left a mark on the world great enough that whatever higher power in charge of the cycle of death and life deemed them worth another chance. This significantly mollified the two girls, though neither was too thrilled by this piece of information which explained a lot about the rather low fertility of the angels, fallen angels and devils. The end result of their meeting however, was thus, the shinobi and their peerages were from that moment assigned primarily with hunting stray devils of more significant power and turning them into sacred gears. Knowledge of this, however, was to be kept from the general public since some may consider the idea of turning their peerage members into strays just so they could get a devil arm out of them somehow. In fact, until they had a decently large amount of them and had decided on a way to distribute them, the devil arms would not be used by anyone outside the shinobi and their peerages, also giving them the time to test them out for potential bugs. For the first few months, their schedule consisted mostly of going through reports on the sightings and assessments of various stray devils of above average power and then going to take them down. There had a few slip-ups at the beginning mainly in the form of some of the biju being overenthusiastic in taking down some strays which led to said strays being wounded to the point of dying before they could be used to empower the devil arm core made from their evil pieces, if they were not outright vaporized from the get-go like when Sun Goku got pissed off at a spider-like stray and encased the thing in molten lava. Thankfully, they only lost a couple sacred gears that way as even when the strays did not survive long enough to be used in making the devil arms, the biju, Naruto and Hanada were perceptive and fast enough to extract the god-given tools from the dying strays. Of course, 
Not all the stray devils they targeted were sacred gear users for which in turn they created devil arm variants of. Quite a few of them were lacking such artifacts allowing them to either use their evil pieces to create devil arm variants of the sacred gears they removed from strays that had died too quickly or those deemed more useful. Or, of course, they could improvise and create the devil arms of their own design. Karama had started the trend by creating Primal Instinct, a devil arm that allowed the user to sense the negative emotions within a hundred feet radius, which mimicked her own ability. Not wanting to be left behind, Shukaku went and made two. The first one, Desert's Embrace, allowed the user to capture enemies in cocoons of hardened sand, created from the ground around them, and then crush them by making the cocoons implode. The second one, Cursed Seal, allowed the user to apply cursed seals on their targets through direct contact, with the seals having the power to expand over the victim's body on command to freeze up their movements. Matabi messed up somehow in her attempt of creating as devil arm capable of granting the user the scorch release she tended to bestow upon her Jinchuriki. Instead, she somehow created a devil arm that allowed the wielder to conjure large amount of blue flames that, while similar in appearance to the ones she herself used, were actually different and held potent purifying powers, not actually holy but similar enough. She named it Blue Penance. Gyuki was not too enthusiastic about the idea of joining in, but went ahead and created a devil arm in the form of a brush that needed no ink as it held an amount of his highly potent ink limited only by how much energy the user was willing to invest in it. He then simply named it Rider's Brush, and by the time he had finished explaining what it did Sai had already snatched it up and Naruto was begging the Hachibi to make him one as well. Deciding to give it a try as well, Chomei created a devil arm that allowed the user to create and manipulate a material similar to spider silk, allowing the creation of webs and cocoons to trap the opponent. She named it Silken Bindings. Son Goku decided to make an offensive devil arm considering so many of his kin had made either binding or auxiliary ones, he created Magma's Embrace which not only allowed the user to conjure large globs of lava but also coat their entire body with a layer of the superheated substance that while harmless to the wielder could incinerate others on contact. Kakuo went ahead and used an S-class stray devil possessing not one but two rook pieces, which had been used on him in the hopes of forcing him to grow to that level over time, in the creation of steaming might which allowed the user to double his strength every 10 seconds without any limit beyond what the user's body could handle. Isobu, at Shukaku's pestering, decided to make one as well if only to get the humanized Tanuki to leave her alone. Thus, she created Coral Birth that allowed the user to create corals anywhere within their line of sight. Saiken decided she was going to make offensive devil arm like Son Goku had and went ahead to create Acid Burst which allowed the user to conjure up what appeared to be soap bubbles that were actually made of acid and were highly explosive. Deciding that her primal instinct was too tame, and that there was no way she was going Shukaku be the only one to make two devil arms, Kurama did some thinking and calculations and ended up creating Demon's Power which doubled the user's energy every 10 seconds with no limit essentially ensuring they would be unlikely to run out during battle. Of course, how much one's reserves could increase by how much their body could handle. Seeing that the Biju had all essentially made devil arm versions of their own unique abilities, Naruto decided to follow the trend and worked his ass off in designing and then creating Sage's Blessing which allowed the user to absorb any kind of energy they come in contact with, be it demonic, natural and even holy energy, purify and convert it into the user's own and only then add it to their reserves. It, like the Divine Dividing, also had a safety feature of expelling excess energy to avoid harm to the user only unlike the Longinus which released that energy through its wings, the Sage's Blessing released that energy from all over the wielder's body, allowing to use the expelling energy in burst to deflect incoming attacks. In essence, it ensured the wielder would never run out of energy. Of course, for something of this magnitude not only was the sacrifice of an ultimate class stray devil required, but also a crystal core from a mutated queen piece or equivalent which Naruto created from scratch out of a Gudadama. Hanada had the same approach but decided to be more practical and created the white eye which mimicked the Byakugan's abilities but only within 10 meters, being meant primarily to be a tool used by healers to see what's wrong with their patients. The relative peace and quiet ended when they received an urgent recall message to Ajuka's office rather than his lab, where they usually met up with him. They took it as a sign that he would be acting in official capacity. Sure enough, at their arrival they found out that all the Mao were in attendance along with an elderly man that instantly put them on edge. The reason? He was old. Considering the fact that the devils had gone through the great war between the three biblical factions and then through a civil war, 
This particular devil being old meant that he was seriously powerful to have survived this long. The fact that he could have altered his appearance to appear much younger also indicated some cunning, an attempt to appear weaker than he actually was. Glad to see you all respond so promptly. Sirzek spoke up as soon as he caught sight of them. An urgent situation has arisen and we need you to deal with it immediately. First, however, allow me to introduce Zekram Bael, the first head of the House of Bael, the original great king. He nodded respectfully towards the violet-eyed dark-haired gentleman. Troublesome. Shikamaru sighed. Just how bad is the situation if all four Mao and the great king saw fit to present it together? He asked warily. Not exactly to the level of a war starting, but if things get out of hand it could certainly lead to that. A wide-awake Falbium Asmodeus replied, his very presence and alertness speaking volumes of how bad things were. But first, we need to give you some background information. Completing the image of seriousness was a Seraphal Leviathan who was not wearing her magical girl outfit but a dress fitting her position. As I'm sure you noticed before, the sets of evil pieces high class devils and above lack one piece in particular that is present in chess. Ajuka began. The king. Naruto's eyes narrowed. He had wondered, indeed, why prideful creatures like devils gave things like endurance, strength, speed and reserves to their servants yet did not get any power-ups themselves. In my original design, there was a king piece among the evil pieces. However, it quickly became apparent that not only were the effects rather unstable, but those who used them became far too powerful which upset the already fragile balance of power in the aftermath of the civil war with the old Mao faction. Ajuka explained. Unlike the other pieces which grant special abilities, the king piece simply boosts a person's power. However, the king piece's strengthening is anywhere from 10 to 100 times and more. There are restrictions to its use. 1. The user cannot already have an evil piece because the king piece would overlap with their current piece and expose them to dangers. 2. The user can potentially die if they are too strong. There are only 9 unused king pieces in existence, banned from further use. Here he paused before turned towards Zekram. Until yesterday evening, there were 10. Ona of my descendants, a third cousin of the current head of the Bael clan chose to support his elder sister by becoming her queen around a century and a half ago. Zekram picked up the explanation. However, recently it appears that Zephyros has grown angry of his position and jealous of his king's, Ziragal's, power which even with the boost of his queen piece still surpasses his. Let me guess. He got his hands on a king piece and used it. Karama spoke up flatly. Indeed. Zekram confirmed. One of the unused king pieces had been left in the care of the Bael clan and kept under high security. The investigation of how exactly he even know about it, never mind how he managed to gain access to it, is still ongoing. But the fact is, Zephyros obtained the king piece, used it on himself and then killed Ziragal before fleeing while displaying rather unstable behavior. Didn't he know people who already have an evil piece can use it? Sakura spoke up. I would not be surprised if rather than that, he thought that only pure-blooded devils could use it. Which is also true considering reincarnated devils automatically disqualify. Sirzek sighed. How unstable is he? Naruto frowned, having personal experience with unstable power-ups. Very. At the rate things are going, he will literally explode within a week, tops. Ajuka replied. Then I suppose the question is whether you want us to put him down or to capture him so you can do it yourselves. Shikamaru deduced. I want him dead. He is not only a stray, but a kin slayer as well. Zekra muttered. Glancing at the Mao they received nods of confirmation. All right then. Naruto nodded. I don't suppose you know where we can start tracking him down. Even better. Ajuka smirked. We discovered his general location and placed a teleportation disruption field over the whole region. He won't be able to teleport away and from what I understand he was never the most athletic person even before his body started becoming unstable from the king piece. Well, that will certainly make things easier. Naruto smirked confidently. Just one question. Hanabi spoke up. If he does explode, just what kind of damage should we expect? Well, let's put it this way. Ajuka grimaced. Most high class devils have smaller territories than what the crater would be. So we need to kill him quickly, lest the stress of battle makes him even more unstable. And if he does blow up, we won't be able to teleport away. Shikamaru summarized their situation. Swell. I admit, I am rather surprised how blasé you are about the existence of the king piece. 
Zekram remarked curiously. I'm already strong enough and will only get stronger as I train. Naruto pointed out. I don't need a king piece. And if someone is using it without getting themselves and those around them killed, not my problem. Even if some of the top players of the raiding games only got there by using a king piece. Zekram prodded. Boss. What do you think the chances of my peerage are in a raiding game with those particular top players? Naruto asked Ajuka with obvious amusement. You would wipe the floor with them. Only Dehauser Belial, who doesn't use a king piece, would be able to pose a serious threat to you, and not only because his clan's signature ability, worthlessness. Ajuka explained. I see. Well, with those people who use the king piece having no chance against me, why I should be upset? Besides, I'm a shinobi and my way of fighting has nothing against the king piece. Naruto shrugged. Your shinobi way of fighting? Zekram raised an eyebrow. If you're not cheating during battle, you're doing it wrong. Naruto smirked. Quite the interesting queen, you've got for yourself, Ajuka. I look forward to good news. Zekram smiled as he left. The group remained in silence for a few more seconds. He teleported away. Hanada announced, allowing them all to relax. So, given that you're sending us instead of, say, Sirzek's peerage, you don't want us to just kill of this guy. Shikamaru spoke up. Indeed. Sirzek agreed. This gives you an opportunity to create a devil arm potentially on par with one of the Longinus class sacred gears. Had the other king piece users been viable, we would have suggested already however amongst the few that use it, even fewer are people of more dubious interests while the remainder are actually decent people. As all of them are immensely powerful and influential, we cannot risk alienating them lest some of the more volatile ones decide to take their anger out on innocent people when they rebel. I plan on calling it a Satan class devil arm. Ajuka spoke up. This devil arm. What do you want to do with it? Naruto asked hesitantly. Well, Sirzex began. Why do you ask? He shot back. Well, if you have a certain purpose in mind for it, I can tailor it to fit that purpose. Naruto pointed out. You're going to keep it. Falbium replied. Come again? Naruto blinked. There have been some incidents that we managed to link to the old Mao faction. They are becoming more and more active. Sirzex sighed. Considering that they've been silent over the past three centuries, it's likely that they will make an attempt to seize power in the near future. As such, we need to give the strongest players on our side some power-ups, just in case they've cooked up something dangerous during their absence. Ajuka added. Shalba Beelzebub, one of the descendants of the original Mao Beelzebub, is also an inventor and a genius in his own right. I doubt he stood idle for centuries. The Satan class devil arms after yours will be for us Mao, Grafia Chan and Karama Chan, Seraphal told them. In other words, the most powerful people on your side that are directly affiliated to you thus completely trustworthy. Sakura nodded. How many will there be in total? Nine. One for each level of hell, Sirzex replied. So that means you need to come up with two more people to use them. Hanada mused before adding when several pairs of eyes turned towards her in consideration. Sorry, I already have plans for a specific devil arm that I'm designing. Which you can make powerful enough to be a Satan class one, Ajuka pointed out. But, I wanted to make one for Hanabi as well. Hanada lowered her head. You can make the one you originally planned for me in a stronger version of it for yourself, sis. Hanabi pointed out. Even some of the Longinus class sacred gears have lesser versions out there. That's true, Hanada bit her lip. Very well. If you want to trust me with this responsibility, I will do my best not to disappoint you she decided. That leaves one more person. Falbium began to look at Gyuki. I already have a devil arm and I don't want to replace it, so drop it, the Hachibi said flatly. Well, I suppose we can decide on the last candidate later on. Seraphal changed the subject. Another reason why we chose you to deal with Zephyros Biel is because you have available to you another form of teleportation that would allow you to get out of there if the worst happens, and this one is not inhibited by the suppression spell over the region. Hiraishin. Shikamaru frowned. In a new world where people already had a teleportation spell, with only himself knowing his father's legendary jutsu despite not having mastered it himself, Naruto had decided to share it with his fellow shinobi and the biju. They all could use it now, but not in battle as every trip disorientated them something fierce unlike the teleportation spell which had a much smoother transition. As such, only Naruto, 
Karama, Hanada and Hanabi who were used with intense high-speed combat were able to use the Hiraishin in combat. To simply travel away from somewhere, though, that was something they were all capable of in a split second if the situation called for it and they were prepared. All right then. If you say that this devil arm will be for my use, I need to get some things from the lab to use in making it. Give me five minutes. Naruto said before disappearing a yellow flash. Reappearing at a marker he had placed in the lab they did their devil arm research in, he quickly gathered a number of crystals and stored them in a scroll that he then placed in one of his hidden pockets before teleporting back to Hanada's side. Done. He told the group. Got everything. Good. I'm teleporting you to the edge of the sealed off area. Ajuka informed them as a large teleportation circle appeared under the shinobi and biju. From there, you should be able of tracking him down. Be careful. Don't get yourselves killed. If you can't get him alive to make the devil arm, it's better to just kill him. Don't take unnecessary risks, Naruto-kun. Seraphal insisted with some worry for the blonde whom she knew could at times be so focused on a task that he ignored dangers to himself. Don't worry. I'll pull his ass out of the fire if things get tough. Like usual. Karama smirked. You're the last person who should talk about asses being on fire. Hanada giggled. You swore you would never bring that up. Karama reddened. No, you begged me to swear. I never actually agreed to anything. Hanada chuckled. Oh, this I have to hear. Naruto's grin widened. Perhaps some other time. Hanada thought better as she remembered the entire content of that encounter. We have work to do right now. Right, everyone ready. Naruto glanced around. Let's do this already. Kurama rolled her eyes. Anyone want to chicken out? Shukaku taunted. Why? This is just some juice up high class, Sakura began. Ultimate class. Sirzex corrected in amusement. Ultimate class devil with the power to totally obliterate things and people form existence. Why should we be worried? She finished sarcastically. That's the spirit. Naruto grinned and gave Ajuka a tune BS up, being teleported away moments later. Appearing in a rocky area, Hanada and Hanabi instantly activated their Byakugan and checked their surroundings. Clear. He's not here nor within a 10 mile radius, Hanada informed them. Our turn then. Kurama nodded towards Naruto and they both closed their eyes and inhaled softly as they entered Sage Mode and Six Paths Sage Mode. Black markings reminiscent of her fox forms appearing around her eyes while Naruto gained no skin markings himself. Opening their eyes, their eyes were near identical in that they were both orange with slit pupils, however Karamas were closer to red than the blondes. Found him. A massive and fluctuating energy signature in that direction. The whiskered blonde pointed. It's pretty damn far away. Karama grumbled. I'll fly you guys there. Chome offered. That could work. Beats us individually flying there since that way he'll be able to see how many of us are right off the bat. Shikamaru gave his approval. All right then. Naruto gave her his okay as well and within seconds Chome had taken her Nanabi form and took off as soon as they all climbed on her back. So, what's the plan of approach? Sai inquired. First of all, we need to contain him. Unless he's a complete idiot, he won't stick around once he sees how many of us are there and how powerful so many of us are. Shikamaru began. That means a barrier. Sakura nodded. I suggest four of the biju do it. I agree. Isobu is a given since she can use her coral birth devil arm from a distance, hindering Zephyro's Bael even while sustaining the barrier. Hanada pointed out. That's fine with me. The Sanbi who now looked like an older Rin Nohara, her once host, agreed. I would normally suggest Shukaku since he can control his sand from a distance, but since we plan on capturing this guy his talent with cursed seals will be more useful in close range. Hanabi spoke up. Damn right. Shukaku smirked. Between me, Naruto and White Face using my cursed seal devil arm, we'll pin that fucker down in no time. The bald Gara lookalike bragged. I'll do it. I'll sustain the barrier. Chomei spoke up. I as well. Saiken added, nodding her blonde head. All right. We need just one more for a stable four corner barrier. Naruto said after staring just a bit longer at Saiken. Who could blame him, though? He still had not gotten over the fact that she had taken the form of the busty Tsunade Senju of all people. When asked how the hell she had done that, considering that Tsunade had not been her Jinchuriki or even spent time around the Rokubi, Saiken had revealed that Katsuyu, Tsunade's personal summon, 
was actually an attempt of the slug Baijus at having children, which resulted in what would become the slug boss Katsuyu who was a mutated clone of Seikens, both chakra being and organic, which led to its ability to break apart into hundreds if not thousands of smaller versions of Katsuyu. Katsuyu also maintained a telepathic chakra link with Seiken allowing the Biju to see its memories and even share its senses at times. Hence the familiarity to Tsunade which allowed Seiken to take her form. Hum, I'll do it. Gyuki who held the appearance of Killer B, his last host, decided. Good. Now what is the combat approach? Sakura inquired. First of all, unless you have full body protection or super regeneration, you're not taking him on up close, Shikamaru began. Time skip. An hour later Zephyros Bio was experiencing a confusing form of both ecstasy and agony. His body ached as is distorted and morphed monstrously before he managed to exert his will to bring it back to normal, only for another part of his body to go out of control. It was a vicious cycle that he could not break without giving it his entire attention and that was impossible as he trudged along to get even further from civilization, to find a safe spot to finish his transformation into a true demon. Fools. Zephyros sneered inwardly as the thought of the Mao who had forbidden further use of the king pieces. They could have become gods. We could have conquered the rest of the underworld from the fallen angels as well as heaven from the angels, but I'm not a coward like them. I will gain power beyond theirs and I will lead devils into a new era. He thought with a maniac smile as he felt his power reach the highest levels of ultimate class and break through, entering the world of true monsters, of super devils, and continue growing. Then, he stiffened as he felt a powerful presence approaching. Looking in its direction, he blinked a few times at the sight before his eyes. And for a good reason, as it was not every day that one saw a humongous blue rhinoceros beetle with six orange wings growing from its abdomen flying towards him. The, hell? Zephyros muttered before his eyes narrowed as four small objects shot from on top of it in different directions. Seconds later several other devils jumped off and landed while the rhinoceros beetle transformed into a tanned mint-haired girl that joined them. Zephyros Biel. Naruto spoke as he stepped forward. Queen of Beelzebub. The Biel sneered. So your master sent you after me, did he? Let me guess. You want me to come quietly? Not really. Naruto admitted. I was just going to tell you that the king piece was meant to be used on those without any other evil pieces in them, otherwise they die. What? The Biel stared in shock. And your death will also be excruciatingly painful, I hear. So Ajuka sent us to put you out of your misery quicker. Naruto shrugged. Like hell. You lie. Zephyros snarled. You're just jealous of my power. Yeah, didn't think it would work the easy way. Naruto sighed, go. At his signal, Isobu, Saiken, Chomei and Yuki disappeared in red flashes, reappearing at the kanai with Hiroishin markers that had been thrown earlier. Shisekyojin. The four biju called out together and a massive red barrier was erected around the entire area. Scatter. Naruto ordered as soon as the barrier appeared right in time for them to avoid the huge blast of power of destruction the Biel sent their way. Follow the plan, he added. In response, blue flames erupted from Matabi's Yugito-like body and shot at Zephyros in the form of multiple bullets, most of which he dodged with his queen speed but a couple grazed him earning groans of pain as the purifying flames ate at his demonic body. The ground under him shuddered and torrents of lava erupted causing the Biel to take to the sky where he had to dodge dozens of spears of sand that had been compressed to the point it was about as hard as diamond. Diving low, he avoided the attack only to find himself face to face with Sakura who already had her fist cocked back, glowing green. Shanaru. She yelled as she punched him in the gut with all her strength, knocking him across the field into the barrier. I, I will, I will not, he grunted as he struggled to get up. I will not be bested by lowly reincarnated devils. He roared as power erupted from him and he began to morph, within seconds doubling in size with bulging muscles and a crown of horns, his entire body was now a sickly purplish black. Die worms. With that, he began to shoot large balls of power of destruction all over the place from his hands and gaping maw, forcing everyone to dodge like hell or erect barriers to take the hits, be it made of lava or stone, none of them bothering to use magical barriers since they lacked the skill to make any powerful enough to block blasts that large of the power of destruction. Enin Hoka. Son Goku, the Roshi lookalike, called out as he shot a blast of green flames at Zephyros, forcing him to block the fire with his arms which caught fire which was unfortunately extinguished as the Biel flared his power. 
Enough of this. Kakuo, who had the appearance of a solidly built silver haired man with green eyes, supposedly Han. His last Jinchuriki, though nobody of those present ever say the man without his steam armor to recognize him, roared as he used his night speed to flash to the bale's side and, with his entire body enhanced to the max by the footin. Kairiki Muso the boil release. Unrivaled strength. He began to punch and kick into the dark purple body, creating shock waves as he pounded him into the barrier, caving his chest in and breaking a couple of his limbs. Shukaku. Seal him. Naruto ordered. Got it, Naruto. The Ichibi grinned as sand erupted from around the bile causing Kakuo to back away as it wrapped around the stray, black markings beginning to climb up his form as well as a cursed seal was being applied from a distance. Only for it all to be blasted off by a wave of power of destruction what vaporized everything within a 6 meter radius and damaged for things for twice that distance, including Kukuo's left arm which was destroyed utterly. Damn it. The Gobi growled as he quickly got out of there. Kakuo. Naruto called out. It's fine, it's already growing back. I'll be fine. The Gobi shot back as he channeled his Biju chakra into the wound. It was something they had discovered during one of the more dangerous hunts when Matabi's left leg was cut off by a stray blade of wind. They were preparing to have it reattached when they realized the leg had already begun regenerating and channeling their potent chakra into the wound made their regeneration nearly on par with the Phoenix clan. As such, in the time the shinobi and the biju began returning the fight to the Bael, Kokuo's arm had already been replaced. Unfortunately, Unlike the Phoenix who somehow managed to confer their regenerative abilities to their clothing as well, the Biju were not that good at it, hence why the Gobi was now missing one of his armored sleeves. Zephidor was done holding back. Until now, he had been holding a large amount of his power back to avoid further destabilization in his body, but it was becoming clear that the way things were going he was going to die. I can focus to changing back later. Right now, I will use all my power to crush these worms. He thought angrily as he allowed his full power to surge through his body, engulfing his form in the power of destruction even as it continued to grow until he was 10 meters tall. Shit. Naruto swore. He's like a giant version of what I heard of Sirzek's true form. Kurama. We're going all out. Hanada. Hanabi. Shikamaru. Shukaku and Sai. When I give you the signal, move into Maim and bind him. Until then, everyone back as far away as you can. I could not agree more. Kurama snarled as she entered what looked like a nine-tailed version 1 Jinchuriki form, engulfed in the red Biju chakra, her nine tails included. Then, with a burst of power she entered the version 2 form, dark crimson chakra and blood obscuring her features, making her look like a miniature version of her Biju form. A final transformation followed once her six pairs of devil wings were unfurled, leaving her body as black and as smooth as a Baijudama, with a dark crimson aura emanating from her. Her female features once again distinguishable despite her entire body being essentially made from super dense concentrated biju chakra capable of exploding. On his part, Naruto had also assumed his true devil form, his body now made of gudadama with ten tails waving behind him and six pairs of wings keeping him afloat, ten black orbs of the same substance he now was floating behind him. In response to this this, Zephyros Bael unleashed more and more of his own power the aura of power of destruction growing as did his size until he was around 15 meters tall, six pairs of wings having unfurled from his back also. Then, he gathered a massive amount of power of destruction between his cupped hands and unleashed it towards the two in an expanding wall of destruction. They did not block it. They did not dodge it. They did not counter it. Instead, they blasted straight through it like it was water and flickered into view on either side of the stray bile. A flicker of movement later. Kurama had kicked him in the gut causing a massive, Baijudama-like explosion that shot him into the sky in Naruto's direction. The ten-tailed queen of Beelzebub intercepted the stray with a raiden. Rasengan as big as Zephyros was tall, slamming the Bael towards Kurama who intercepted with a fist-sized Baijudama that blasted the stray into the barrier. Before it could get up, Naruto sent a futon. Odama Rosenshuriken at the stray engulfing him in a dome of billions of tiny wind blades that attacked him at a molecular level. Hanada. Hanabi. What's his state? Naruto demanded. Alive but he won't be a threat in short term, Hanabi replied. Good. As soon as the dome dies down, move in to seal his movements. The blonde ordered as he landed at the edge of the wind dome before stepping through, unaffected by it as he had not infused any senjutsu chakra into the jutsu. 
Reaching Zephyros just before the wind fully died out, he thrust his arm engulfed in a dark orange aura into he stray Bale's chest and extracted not just the king piece but the now mutated queen piece as well. As the others focused on binding Zephyros, Naruto reprogrammed the evil pieces and then merged them into a bloody crimson sphere with the eleven other crystals he had brought with him, which contained the chakra the nine biju, Hamura Otsutsuki's yin chakra from Hanada and Hagoromo Otsutsuki's yang chakra from himself. Naruto, he doesn't have long, Sakura warned after a quick analysis. Don't worry, I'm done with this. Naruto assured her as he placed the crystal orb on the same large scroll Zephyros was partially on before surging his chakra through the array to activate it. Zephyros screamed in agony for all of ten seconds as the ceiling array ripped him apart and rendered him into pure power that was channeled into to crimson orb, completing its transformation into a devil arm core. Specifically, Naruto's own Satan class devil arm, with the Mao. Back at the office the shinobi and the biju had left. The four Mao were staring at a large screen that had showed them the entire battle. After all, while it was true they had isolated the area, that did not mean they did not have a familiar keeping an eye on Zephyros from a safe distance, capable of transmitting what it saw. I can see why you like them so much, Ajuka. They're good. You would not think your peerage members were in their teens. They fight like warriors twice their age. Falbium mused. They know their limits. They can analyze the situation carefully and know when to back off to not be a burden to their comrades, allowing others who have the right skills to take the fight to the enemy. Sirzex nodded. And that is ignoring the overwhelming power of the Biju. Not one of the nine is Bellow Ultimate Class, with Gyuki being at the highest levels of the rank while Kurama is a super devil. Ajuka smirked. Naruto and Kurama in particular have excellent teamwork, not really surprising if you consider they shared a body until recently, but still. Falbium remarked. If only half of the devils their age showed even 10% of their competence. Forget about power, that can be gained with time. Sears X sighed. But actually fighting, rather than just executing some attacks like you were practicing them during training. How many of the younger generation can you say have anything that as much as resembles their skill and dedication to getting the job done? Frankly. Only your cousin Syra Organ Seraphal's little sister Sona do though in Sona's case she focuses far too much on strategy and neglects gaining the power needed to execute those strategies, Ajuka pointed out. Twitching slightly at the mention of her sister, Seraphal's eyes remained glued to the screen where Naruto was now sealing away the Satan-class devil arm for analysis before actually implanting it into himself. Time skip. That night unlocking the door using the key she had sneaked from the security office earlier, she sneaked down the hall right up to his door and unlocked it also entering his suite. There, she quickly went up to his door and opened it before closing it back silently seconds later as soon as she was inside. Sarah fall? Naruto paused in the middle of his activity to stare at her in shock and embarrassment. Or, hi. Sarah fall greeted in embarrassment, her eyes locked onto the speaking Naruto's cock which had resumed pumping into Karama's mouth. What are you, doing here, at, this hour, uh? Naruto grunted as he came. I, or, Seraphal stuttered. She has a crush on you and had planned to sneak into your bed and seduce you into fucking her brains out. Karama answered instead after she finished swallowing her treat. Is that true? Naruto blushed a bit. Well, yes, Seraphal stared straight at his nine and a half inch still erect cock. Seraphal. Karama spoke up, drawing her attention. If you want to be with him, you will have to be willing to share. You're lucky in that the law says you can't form harems of your own, not that you can't be in someone's harem. I'm willing to share. Seraphal said quickly. Then get over here, on your knees and put that mouth of yours to use. Karama leered and motioned to the free Naruto to go the Leviathan. You can play with the real Naruto for a while. Seconds later, a naked Seraphal was doing just that, sucking on Naruto's cockhead while her soft hands massaged the length and his balls. This only lasted for a few seconds before she looked up at him with a look of pure lust. Nay, Naruto-kun? Can you do something for me? She asked in an innocent voice that was betrayed by the look on her face. Sure. What? Naruto grinned. Fuck. My. Face. She uttered before opening her mouth wide and taking him all in, straight into her throat, until her nose was touching his pelvis, all the while maintaining eye contact with him to get her point across. She need not bothered. Her words had been enough. She did not come by her office the next day, 
and the day after that she sat down as much as she could and walked as little as possible to avoid revealing that she was walking with a limp. A couple weeks had passed since Zephyros Bile used a king piece, killed his king and went stray leading to him being put down in a Satan class devil arm being forged from him and his evil pieces, and the underworld was still talking about it. About Zephyros going stray, of course, as knowledge of devil arms was still on a need to know basis among the Mao, the Shinobi and the Biju. It was the first time someone from the house of Bael had gone stray and by itself it constituted a massive blow to their reputation. After all, it was not a mere reincarnated devil that had gone stray, but a pureblood, his king's younger brother at that. The Biju and the Shinobi doubted it was actually the first time the Bael had a stray. Rather, they were certain they kept a good enough eye on their new servants as to have them killed off as soon they had any sort of evidence of betrayal. Of course, the noise was only among the commoners as with Zekram's appearance the discussion among the nobles on the subject quickly died out and was replaced by subjects the old devil brought up. Such was his influence. However, Naruto and the others were not present to hear the chatter. They were once again hunting strays all over the underworld and human world. And it was during such a mission that Naruto and Hanabi received an urgent call from Seraphal. Hold on, I need to take this. Naruto spoke up as he caught the fist aimed at him and twisted, breaking the leopard like arm of the stray they were fighting. I've got this. Hanabi agreed as she quickly moved to use her juken to render the stray almost paralyzed. Naruto kun. There's a situation near your location that requires immediate intervention. Seraphal spoke as soon as she answered, looking completely serious. Hanabi, kill him. Naruto ordered before focusing his full attention on Seraphal. The stray was not overly strong nor did he possess a sacred gear so it was not really an issue to simply kill him off. What's the problem? A number of devils have teamed up with some rogue fallen angels who have stolen some equipment from Azazel's labs. They plan on sacrificing a human village and bind their souls to a prototype artificial sacred gear Azazel gave up on once he realized what it would cost to complete it. Seraphal explained. Azazel contacted us and requested we deal with it. Apparently, they also stole some equipment that destabilized angelic teleportation, so no angel or fallen angel can get there in time. He lost a handful of his people he sent before realizing they had activated that device. I see. Still, that's pretty gutsy of them. Naruto scowled as he began calming himself to enter sage mode, thus increasing his sensory range. It may be northern Italy, but it's still pretty damn close to the Vatican. They probably plan on finishing and leaving before any exorcists can arrive, Seraphal shrugged. I see, I think I sense them. Yeah, angelic and demonic signatures in the same place without conflict. How often do we have that? Naruto muttered. What should we do with them? Kill them all. We've already discovered how they achieved the theft and rooted out the traitors, Seraphal told him. Got it. I'll let you know when we're done. Naruto nodded and ended the video call. Finished chatting with your lover? Hanabi teased. Yes, but stop saying that in the open. We're trying to keep our relationship private. Naruto frowned. He was not overly happy about it, but he understood how some people would react if some people found out he was sleeping with a Mao, queen of another Mao or not. You heard the situation? Promotion. Knight. Hanabi called out as she increased his speed to that of a knight. Lead the way. With them moving at her top speed, it only took them a couple minutes to reach the village in question and it did not take them long to realize the ritual had already begun. There was also the fact that someone else was already interfering. It was a beautiful teenage blonde wielding a rapier who was moving at an impressive speed for a human as she attacked the devil's present. The reason why they were sure she was human was the lack of demonic energy in her body which both the shinobi would have detected with their respective sensory powers. It was obvious, however, that she was slowly being overpowered. The devils were not strays, the dissonance in their demonic powers having eroded at their reason and their deformed bodies hindering them. No, these were devils in full control of their powers and faculties. Decently strong ones at that, considering that of the dozen of them present. A handful were high class at least in power if not position while the others were middle class. Sure enough, she soon lost hold of her sword and before she could retrieve it one of the demonic attacks blasted her away into a tree, only for moments later stone spikes to erupts and crucify her against said tree. Well, well, well. Looks like the saint's vessel can no longer fight. One of the devils sneered as he approached her. Where's your earlier vigor, hum? I'll tell you where. It's gone just like your precious god. 
you're lying. The blonde spat, yet despite this, desperation was clear in her eyes. God is not dead, he can't be. Hey, you don't have to believe me. You'll see for yourself soon. He sneered as he began gathering power to end her life. Hey, boss. Isn't it a shame to let Jean d'Arc die a virgin twice in a row? One of the other devils asked as he eyed the blonde perversely. You know, you're right. The apparent leader seemed to agree as he halted his spell. Let's help her with that, shall we? Formaline. At this, Naruto decided that discretion was no longer useful and flickered between the blonde and the lead devil, and ripped his torso apart with his hand shrouded in wind chakra. Shit. That's Beelzebub's queen. I'm out of here. One of the other devils screamed as magic circles began to appear under their feet. They did not live that long. Flame like orange chakra erupting around him, Naruto flickered from view only to reappear once again before the blonde as the torsos of the devils exploded in gore. Hold on. I'll get you down from there. Naruto turned towards the girl and using earth manipulation turned the spikes into sand and then extracted every last bit of it with his magnet release. Hanabi. Check to see if there's anything stuck in the wounds. They're clear, though you should wash them first before healing. The Hyuga advised. And hurry, we have other problems as well. Got it. Naruto shot back. Stand still. He instructed as he conjured some water and manipulated it through her wounds, cleaning all the dirt, before dropping it onto the ground as he placed his hands first onto the wounds on her legs. His hands were once more lit in the orange chakra shroud and within seconds of infusing his yang chakra into her body, the leg wounds had healed without as much as a scar, with the holes in her arms following soon after. Do you have any other wounds? He asked her gently. No, thank you. Jean muttered, somewhat in shock that not only he could heal her, what with demonic energy being known to be rather poisonous to human bodies, but that he had even wanted to. Say, is it true what they called you? Beelzebub's queen? Yes, Ajuka is my boss. Naruto confirmed. Then, you must know if it's true. If you're a Mao's queen, you must know if God is really dead. She looked at him pleadingly. I'm sorry, but I've only been a devil for a few months now. Naruto grimaced. I don't know if what those bastards said is true, but I can call Ajuka and ask him about it. After we end the ritual that will sacrifice everyone in this village, Hanabi cut him off. That's more important, you know. It's not like it even matters if God is dead. What do you mean, it doesn't matter? Jean exclaimed angrily as she pushed herself to her feet. If whether he's alive or dead mattered, you'd think everyone or at least the church knew about it. So either he's alive or his existence is not as important the church makes it out to be. Hanabi sniffed. That's not true and you know it, Hanabi. Naruto frowned. Gods get their power from their worshippers. With how many people in the world believe in the biblical god, he's without a doubt the strongest god outside some in the top ten existences. He pointed out as he picked up and handed the rapier back to the girl he saved. Excuse her, but we do need to hurry. Of course. My name is Jean d'Arc, the reincarnation of the Saint of Orleans. The blonde introduced herself. I'm an exorcist from the church. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, Queen of Beelzebub, and she's Hanabi Hayuga, one Ajuka's pawns. The whiskered devil finished the introductions. By the way, I sense a sacred gear in you. Why aren't you using it? There is some spell over the area that disrupts my blade blacksmith. Jean frowned as she followed the two devils, devising hats since they saved her life, she could trust them. That's the one that makes holy swords, right? Naruto mused. Well, we were told that there is spell over the area that messes with angelic power, disrupting teleportation. It's why we were sent. I see. Jean frowned towards her rapier. While enchanted and blessed, it was not worth comparing even to a mass-produced holy sword her sacred gear could make. Here, you can borrow this for the fight. Naruto pulled a long package from a storage dimension. A holy sword? Jean asked in shock as she removed the wrapping. I know a guy who has the same sacred gear as you do and I had him make me a few in case I ever needed them. Naruto shrugged. It has the blade enhanced with wind element to increase cutting power, so it's sharper than usual. Thank you. Jean nodded gratefully. Hanabi? Naruto eyed the brunette. Twenty fallen angels of which one has six wings while the others only have a pair each, and three high-class devils with three pairs of wings each. The Hyuga reported. I was asking how far, but that info is great as well. Naruto blinked. Oh, 
It's just around that corner. Hanabi smiled. The hostages? Jean inquired. Alive but unconscious, likely put asleep with hypnosis. They're unharmed for the most part. Hanabi replied. They're laid together in the middle of the ritual circle. Where are the fallen and the devils? Naruto inquired. Fallen in the air, devils on the ground. Came the Hyuga's reply. I'll take the fallen, you two take the devils. Naruto instructed. Strike quick and efficiently, then move on. Got it. Hanabi nodded. Okay. Jean reluctantly agreed. Move out. He ordered and flickered away, appearing right in front of the strongest fallen to put a Rasengan through his chest before moving on to take out the others. On the ground, while Jean engaged one of the devils and dealt some crippling wounds with her holy sword thanks to the element of surprise, Hanabi danced around two of them, striking their pressure points to render parts of their bodies useless before finishing them off with powerful Jukan palm strikes to the heart. That speed enhancement the evil pieces give is something else. Jean remarked once the fighting was done. Enhancement. Hanabi frowned. I'll have you know that I was just as fast when I was alive. It's true. While we did get a boost, myself especially, the speed you've seen from us is not the fastest we could go when we were still human. Naruto confirmed. That's amazing. Jean muttered. Can you see if you can summon your sacred gear? If it works, then the block they were putting up against holy power is gone. Naruto requested. Sure enough, Jean could summon her blade blacksmith easily and return Naruto's holy sword. Now, to get some answers, he frowned as he called Ajuka. Hum, Naruto? Is something the matter? I thought you were doing something for Seraphal. The green-haired super devil inquired. We just finished, but we heard some of those devils we killed talking about something. Naruto replied. Given that you're calling me on a secure line, it must be something sensitive. Ajuka frowned. Go on, what is it? Is the biblical god dead? Naruto asked bluntly. Yes. Ajuka sighed. During the last battle of the Great War, God and the previous Mao took each other out. How that was possible considering that God was stronger than them combined, we do not know for certain, however I believe it's likely that God had some injuries hindering him, likely from when he sealed away the heavenly dragons. I see. Naruto digested that information. I take it there's a reason why we're keeping quiet about it. I understand why heaven and the church do it, even the Gregory, but why aren't we wearing badges with, God is dead? Because the three factions are still weak and without the presence of the biblical god who with his current followers numbering in billions making him the strongest god, the other factions would slaughter us all. Ajuka replied bluntly. Well, I suppose us devils are quite a bit better off than both heaven and the Gregory, what with our super devils and several ultimate class devils of near Mao level power, but we would still have losses we want to avoid. After all the work we've put into rebuilding our society, Starting a war just because we have bragging rights would be foolish. Yeah, I agree. Naruto nodded. Don't worry, we'll keep it to ourselves. You may tell your peerage and fellow servants once you return to the underworld. Ajuka corrected. I was planning on telling you soon anyway, so it's not really a problem. The custom us Mao sort of made was to tell our peerage members about this around a year after they've been reincarnated. Okay. Just one last thing. Naruto began nervously. Now, supposedly someone else heard about this, an exorcist from the church for example. Put them on. I'll explain their options directly. Ajuka sighed. Your name? He inquired once Jean was facing the holographic screen. Jean d'Arc, she replied. The famed reincarnation. Ajuka blinked in surprise. Yes. It's an honor to speak with you. Jean gave a quick bow. Well, this will make things harder for you, Ajuka mused. Your options are thus. You can stay in the church and pretend to still believe in the dead god, in which you risk discovery like a few others who had been in your positon in the past. You can leave the church and join the Gregory, or you can get reincarnated into a devil. Had you been a regular exorcist, you would have also had the option of joining other factions, however with you being so tightly tied to Christianity, I doubt they would accept you. I, see. Thank you for clearing things up for me, Lord Beelzebub. Jean nodded tightly. Just make sure not to tell others about what happened to God, as it wound in danger them also. Ajuka told her before ending the call. So, I guess this is the part where you make me an offer you can't refuse, right? Jean gave Naruto a bitter smile. No I won't reincarnate you into my peerage right now. Naruto shook his head. 
your world pretty much came crashing down around you. I won't take advantage of you like that when you're vulnerable, even if it may be the devil thing to do. Here, take this. He handed her a tri-bladed kanai with a seal tag on the handle. Throw this into the ground if you want to join my peerage, or even just need my help with something. I'll teleport right over. Is this some sort of new flyer devils give out? Jean asked curiously. Nah, just me. I could give you a regular flyer, but it would have a demonic signature that would get you in trouble with the church. Naruto replied. Thank you. Jean smiled. I'll be sure to call you once I've decided what to do, one way or another. But for now, I need to think. Of course. You can go, Hanabi and I can finish up here. Naruto told her and with a grateful nod, the exorcist left. You were being way too nice to her. Spill. Hanabi demanded once Jean was out of hearing range. It reminded me of how Obito revealed to Sasuke about why Itachi really killed the Uchiha clan, only to then recruit him into the Akatsuki to destroy Konoha. Naruto admitted. I didn't want to be that guy. Okay. I see your point, especially since Sasuke eventually turned on Obito. Hanabi admitted. But if she ends up in your bed, I reserve the right to say, I told you so. Stop talking like I'm some enemy of women. Naruto whined. You know very well that Hanada was the one who invited Saiken. And the others came on their own. I didn't go around seducing them or anything. HMPH, yeah right. Hanabi sniffed and walked over to the nearest hostage. Like you even notice when you're seducing a girl. She muttered under her breath as Naruto made a few dozen clones and put them to work. Time skip. Three weeks later it had been a few weeks since he had met Jean and so far, she had not used the Hiraishin Kanai. She was not dead either, else he would have heard about it through their informants in the church. He was somewhat worried about her, though. He could tell that just like him when he was younger, she was generally honest and cheerful so it was not outside reason that she got caught by one of her higher ups faking her faith and then got secretly imprisoned. When he did feel the call of the beacon that was the Hiraishin Kanai, he spent all of a second to create a cage bunshin to finish writing the report he was working on before teleporting away, appearing crouched and grasping the tri-bladed kanai. Hi. Jean smiled weakly from under her cloak. Hey, how've you been? Naruto greeted. Well enough, considering everything. Jean sighed. Is that offer to join your peerage still open? Sure. I have four pieces left. Naruto agreed. Then please reincarnate me in your peerage. Jean requested as she steeled her resolve, and drew the sword she had been clutching all this time. Jean? Naruto asked warily. He did not feel any ill intent from her though, so what exactly? Under his disbelieving eyes, she stabbed herself through the heart, collapsing soon after. Shit. Naruto swore and went to grab the sword, only for it to erupt in flames that soon engulfed Jean as the sword faded away, the flames themselves following soon after leaving a badly burnt Jean. Without a second though, Naruto pulled out his box of evil pieces from a storage dimension and placed one of his remaining pawns on her chest. I order, in my name Naruto Uzumaki. You, Jean d'Arc. I, resurrect you back to this soil as my servant, and have you reborn as a devil. You, my pawn, be delighted with your new life. He called out causing the pawn piece to sink into her body and engulf her in an orange aura that healed her more serious wounds leaving only a few burn wounds on her body. Picking her up, he once again used Hiraishin and teleported to his suite where he took her to a guest room and placed her down on the bed. Taking in her state, he sighed and began undressing her before doing the same with himself, leaving them wearing only panties and boxers respectively before laying down behind her and hugging her close. She should be okay by morning. He thought before forming a cage bunchen and dispelling it, making it transfer a message to his other clones which in turn would tell his friends what he was doing for the night. Time skip. Next morning it had been three minutes since Naruto and Jean had awoken. It had also been three minutes since she had slapped him hard enough to send him off the bed after waking up with him on top of her, his face nuzzling into her bare breasts. So the reason we were both near naked in the same bed was because you needed skin contact to heal me through the evil piece and finish reincarnating me. Jean mumbled in embarrassment. Sorry for that, Naru-kun, I've been kind of tight strung lately. You haven't explained yet why the hell you stabbed yourself with that sword. Naruto asked her with a frown, trying not to look lower than her face as she used the bedsheet to cover herself. That was the sword of Saint Catherine, which Jeanne d'Arc had during her life but never once swung. She began. It was a sword she died with when she was burnt alive. 
When she died, she did so with the hope of leaving behind all her sins, all her worldly desires, everything that made her impure, it was all burnt into that sword with the same flames that killed her. Okay, Naruto said slowly. While I was meditating, trying to decide what to do now that I know God is dead, I somehow came face to face with her. Jean explained, I am not just her reincarnation, but the inheritor of her spirit, her power, her will, and she was furious. She abandoned her peaceful life, she went to war in the name of God and died in the name of God, all believing it was God who was guiding her path, only to now, after being reincarnated in me with no memories of being in heaven, to discover God was already dead, she was furious. And we decided together for me to become a devil. But, we were not whole. She left behind a part of herself in that sword, her dark side so to speak, and now that I was becoming a devil it was only natural to retrieve it. So you absorbed it by stabbing yourself into the heart with it. Naruto remarked flatly. Well, I suppose I've done much stupider things, he sighed. So, was it a holy sword or something? No, it was, well, not quite a demonic sword. Jean frowned. It held her earthly desires that she had sacrificed to do God's will, or what she thought it was, let's see what it's like. What do you mean? Naruto blinked. Well, now that I've absorbed the sword her personality including what was sealed into the sword will gradually seep and merge with me until we are one. This will not only grant me all her memories, but also all the power I had yet to tap into that I've inherited from her. Jean explained. But I can for a short while allow her personality to take over. I'm not sure that's a good idea, Naruto said quickly. Don't worry, she's unable to do anything that opposes my own desires. Jean assured him as she closed her eyes. Seconds later, her appearance changes slightly as her skin became a bit paler and hair became a more platinum blonde than the sunny blonde from before. Opening her eyes, she revealed light golden irises. What concerned him the most, though, was her expression that could be described in two words, pure lust. Without a word, she pounced on him and straddled him on the ground. J. Jean. Wait, this isn't you, Naruto began in panic. This is us, master. Jean purred as she licked along his pectorals. The Jean of the past is not the only one who was suppressing her desires for the sake of God. What we want the most right now is a man, a good man like you, that will make us his, and his alone. She paused from her ministrations to give him a look of wanting. Will you give it to us, master? How could I say no to my beautiful servant? Naruto sighed with a smile. Great. Jean chirped and in swift motions pulled his boxers down, pulled her panties aside and impaled herself onto his already erect member. Yes. This is what I've wanted for so long. She purred in satisfaction before she began rolling her hips, his own moving to meet hers. Centuries of it. She replied as she lowered her head and raised her other breast to mimic his actions. I've been meaning to take a couple days off anyway. Naruto smirked and in one swift movement he picked her up by the waist and laid her onto the bed where he held her legs spread wide and began pounding into her warmth faster and faster until with a loud grunt he spilled his seed in her depths, triggering her own orgasm, and returning her to her previous state. That felt, amazing. Jean moaned. Are you okay? Naruto asked worriedly, afraid her transformation held similar drawbacks to his own early Jinchuriki transformations. I'm feeling great. Why didn't I do this before? Jean wondered out loud. No wonder so many girls outside the church were so shocked a girl my age willingly withheld from such things, nay, Naru-kun? Yes Jean? Naruto smiled as he gently pulled out of her. You could say that. Naruto nodded slowly, perks of having Jiraiya as a master and several lovers of his own more recently. Teach me everything. The blonde purred pleadingly. That and more. Naruto readily agreed. Great. Now let me clean you up a bit, she decided as she got up and crawled on the bed over to him where she lowered her head and took him in her mouth, beginning to give him a rather sloppy and incredibly erotic blowjob. Fuck a couple days, I'm taking a whole week off and asking my girls to do the same. Naruto growled in pleasure when after blowing his load in her mouth she opened mouth to reveal her prize and made a show of swirling it with her tongue before actually swallowing it all. This time he pounced on her. Time skip. Two months later, Narima, Tokyo, Japan. There was quite a bit of resentment from the church regarding her reincarnation into a devil. But after Ajuka arranged a meeting between her and Naruto with one of the cardinals he knew for sure were aware of God's death, 
The reasons for her defection were made clear to them as the cardinal passed the message along to those in the know and as a whole they decided they got off lightly considering what kind of damage someone like the reincarnation of Jeanne d'Arc could do by spreading the word concerning God's death. Jean also adapted quite well to the shinobi and Baeju's primary duty, that of hunting down stray devils and making devil arms out of them. In fact, she brought forth the idea of doing the same with fallen angels that have gone rogue from the Grigori and were causing trouble, since their fate after death was the same anyway. Of course, things could not be simple for them and in the aftermath of sacrificing a group of six rather depraved fallen angels with only one of them having three pairs of wings while the rest only have one, Naruto's attempt at making a devil arm version of the sword birth led to the creation of a devil arm that produced holy demonic swords rather than demonic ones. This warranted another meeting of the four Mao where after nearly three hours of arguments and negotiations, it was decided that while they would not halt the creation of holy demonic devil arms which were likely to result in the sacrifice of fallen angels to make devil arms, they would keep them in storage even after they put regular devil arms in circulation, until of course either the knowledge of God's death became more common or some other event forced their hand. The only exception was the first holy demonic devil arm named Blade Birth as it was basically a combination of the holy sword-making Blade Blacksmith and the demonic sword-making Sword Birth, which was entrusted to Jean with a prepared excuse of saying that the holy nature of the soul of the Maiden of Orleans warping her sacred gear Blade Blacksmith when she became a devil, just in case someone noticed and asked, which was unlikely unless she made the mistake of leaving her creations around. The only place she was allowed to leave holy demonic swords was Ajuka's lab where the Mao was investigating their very existence. Another important event was that soon after Jean got over the euphoria of becoming a devil, and cementing her primary sin as lust, Hinata discovered that the silver-eyed blonde former exorcist now had a chakra circulatory system. It was Ajuka who ended up explaining how that occurred. Simply put, there were occasions when certain abilities of high-class devils were so potent or abstract that when they bound their evil pieces to themselves, they imprinted some of those abilities upon their pieces and thus passed them down to a certain extent to their peerage members. A perfect example was the affinity for fire of the Phoenix clan which was a rarity not to be given to all their peerage members, considering how intimately the Phoenix were connected to the element of fire. As such, it was quite likely that anyone reincarnated into devil by Naruto or the other shinobi would gain a chakra circulatory system. As for the biju, well, Considering that their previous forms were that of pure chakra concentrated to the point of being physical, it was a foregone conclusion that any potential peerage they may recruit once they gained their evil pieces would gain access to chakra. Until then, though, they would be content on teaching Jean how to harness her chakra. While they lacked certain training tools from the elemental nations such as chakra paper and such, Naruto could use his ninshu to detect a person's chakra natures and elemental affinities. It came as no surprise that Jean had a strong yang chakra as well as a yin chakra of similar strength due to the recent remerging with her past life's darker side. She also held very potent wind and fire elemental affinities which reflected in her personality being mostly carefree yet at the same times quite passionate. Of course, until she could even think of using he elements she was put to train her chakra control, and promptly began cackling maniacally when she was taught the water walking exercise. Despite all the training though, she was still going out in the field and helping the shinobi and biju hunt strays, and currently, she was tagging along with Naruto, Hanabi and Shikamaru to assist in the capture of a particularly infamous stray devil, one ranked as a SS class threat, Kuroka, the black cat, whose betrayal of her king led to the Nekomata genocide. However, something is wrong, Hanabi frowned, I agree, Naruto scowled. Troublesome. Here we go again. Shikamaru sighed. What do you mean? Jean glanced between the two sensors who were using their Byakugan and Sage mode respectively, and the lazy shadow user who appeared resigned. This is the part where the plan gets abandoned in favor of some crazy scheme Naruto comes up with. Shikamaru shrugged. You don't seem that upset about it, Jean pointed out. His crazy schemes tend to work. The Nara shrugged. So? What's wrong? He eyed the sensors. For one thing, she looks exactly like she did before. No deformations, no extra appendages, nothing. Hanabi began, most stray devils suffer from physical transformation as a backlash of severing their connections with their king within the first few days, a year at most. She's been astray for a few years now and still no side effects. That should be impossible. Unless she has near perfect control over her life force which can only be achieved through the use of senjutsu. 
Naruto countered. Senjutsu which supposedly overwhelmed her which led to her stray status in the first place. In other words, it was not the power going to her head and her losing control of herself that caused her to kill her king, like the reports say. Shikamaru frowned. Does it even matter? Jean frowned. At the end of the day she's still a stray, a particularly hated one at that. Even if she took the blame for someone else or something like that, the nobles won't care. Her king was the Dantalion heir, from one of the remaining pillars of the underworld. It was just luck that his mother had just given birth to a girl when he was killed, lest their line would be in danger of extinction. She, has a point. Shikamaru admitted. You all know that they used her to justify the Nekomata hunt, even if it was just an excuse for the more bloodthirsty devils to cut loose and murder them. They won't even accept the idea of her being innocent. If she is, which we are just speculating, by the way, never mind clearing her charges. Hum, that's a good point. Hanabi mused before turning her head towards a seemingly empty spot a few feet away from their location. What do you think, Kuroka-san? She raised an eyebrow. There was a moment of silence before the image was distorted which signified an ending illusion before the very stray they were after was revealed in her full glory. And she was quite the sight. Kuroka was a beautiful and attractive young woman with a voluptuous figure, long black hair with split bangs, and hazel gold eyes with cat-like pupils. Her attire consisted of a black kimono, a yellow obi, a set of golden beads, and an ornately detailed headband. The kimono features a red interior and it is open at her shoulders, giving view to her enormous breasts. To top it off, she had a pair of black cat ears and two black tails. NYA, so you have some sensor in your group. I suppose that was how you tracked me down, but how did you see through my illusion, NYA? I did strengthen it with Senjutsu. Kuroka spoke up curiously. HMPH, like that paltry trick could fool my Byakugan. Hanabi huffed in a superior tone. They're not called the all seeing eyes for nothing. I see, I see. Kuroka nodded slyly. Well, since you're here, we're going to capture you. Naruto spoke up. Don't worry, we won't kill you in a messy manner like we originally intended, but we do need you to answer some questions for us, he told her cheerfully. Fufu, so you think you can catch me, NYA? Kuroka taunted. You may be stronger than me, Beelzebub's queen and all, but that does not mean you're also faster than me, NYA, she declared as she tensed a bit. I'm sorry, you misunderstood. Naruto gave her his prankster grin. We don't need to catch you. Wah, Naya. She screamed as two arms erupted from beneath her, grabbed her legs and pulled her underground until only her hair was above the surface. You were already in my trap. Naruto chuckled. That should teach you not to sneak on the king of pranks. Ha 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 ha. He proceeded to give an over the top laugh. That was great, Naru kun. Jean chuckled. Curiosity caught the cat, right? Yep. Naruto agreed. Troublesome blondes. Shikamaru sighed. Just deal with her and let's get back. I want to take a nap. Sure, sure. Naruto sighed and approached the struggling Kuroka while muttering under his breath about lazy Nara. W what are you doing, NYA? The stray cat asked nervously as she eyed his glowing right hand. I'm going to have you take a nap. Naruto replied as he tapped her forehead, placing a seal on her that knocked her unconscious. Time skip. A week later, you know, Naruto, our lives were much more peaceful before we met you. Ajuka sighed as they went over the results of the investigation in Kuroka's case. On the one hand, she was indeed guilty of killing her king and most of his peerage. On the other hand, she had a damn good reason to do so. As it turned out, like many of his family Hesgeth Dantalion was obsessed with acquiring rare and valuable knowledge. Unlike most, however, he used this knowledge to experiment on his peerage making them much stronger they would normally be. However many of the modifications he did were not only illegal, but also excruciatingly painful, mostly leading to their minds being broken into slaves utterly subservient to him. It certainly explained why in the early days of him forming a peerage a couple of his servants went stray and killed themselves at the prospect of being dragged back to their former king. Kuroka was not put through any excessive enhancements, unlike her fellow peerage members. As a Nekosho talented in both Senjutsu and Yujutsu, she was simply too valuable to risk. Hence she was mostly pushed to increase he demonic power as much as possible, to draw out as much of her bishop enhancements as she could. So Hesgeth turned his attention to Sharon, Kuroka's younger sister. Apparently, 
The reason Kuroka even accepted of joining his peerage in the first place was to protect her sister and give her a more stable home. This backfired leading to Sharon essentially being kept hostage to keep Kuroka in line when it became apparent that the older Nekosho was not only more talented than her master but also more powerful than him. Of course, as soon as Kuroka got wind of his intentions, she slaughtered him and any of his servants that got in the way before escaping, and leaving her sister behind. Apparently, she was hoping that with witness testifying that she was the culprit, her sister would be left alone, which ended up with not only his sister being slated for execution, but her entire species within the underworld begin hunted down and killed by various devils. Ah! The easiest thing to do would be to simply execute Kuroka. It's been years since the Nekomata genocide and things have died down. Quite a few people even recruited Nekomata into their peerage despite what happened with Kuroka. No need to bring it up again and stir bad blood. But, Sirzex grimaced. The problem was personal for him. He had used his authority as a Mao to save Sharon from execution and placed her in the care of his younger sister, Rias Gremory, who renamed the petite Nekosho Kaniko Tujo and reincarnated her into her rook. So while it was indeed easy to kill off Kuroka, it also meant betraying Kaniko who through Rias was now part of his family, and if there was one thing the Gremory clan valued, it as family. How about if the Dantalian clan themselves pardoned her? Shikamaru spoke up eventually, eyes still locked onto a file. Fat chance of that happening. Sirzex shook his head. Let's just assume, for a moment, that they do. What would be the outcome of that? Shikamaru insisted, his eyes moving to Ajuka. If the harmed party withdraws their charges, then Kuroka would be free but still have to answer to the Dantalian clan since she was reincarnated as one of their servants, Ajuka replied. Say, it's illegal to intentionally modify the evil pieces without your permission, isn't it? Naruto began thoughtfully. Yes. But Kuroka's two bishop pieces were not modified by an outside force. In fact, due to her growth, one of them has even mutated. Ajuka frowned. Yeah. Naruto nodded. You know that. And we know that. But the Dantalian clan don't, now do they? He smirked mischievously. A week later, it was the hottest news in the underworld. The infamous stray cat Kuroka was cleared off all charges by not only the Mao but the Dantalian clan themselves, when it was proven that her rampage was not caused by her overuse of senjutsu but due to her master recklessly trying to modify her evil pieces while they were still inside her. To prevent future negative reactions due to her damaged pieces, Naruto Uzumaki, Queen of Beelzebub, had graciously recruited her as his pawn. Rias Gremory was upset. She had made a miscalculation and was now reaping the consequences of her carelessness. Well, Technically she made two miscalculations, but the later was insignificant compared to the first. Her first mistake, and one with far-reaching consequences, was being too passive. Oh, she had taken the necessary measures once she had concluded that Issei Hyodo was the newest possessor of the boosted gear, the Red Dragon Emperor's Gauntlet, one of the thirteen Longinus-class sacred gears that held the potential to slay a god. She had contacted her brother had made arrangements with the elders and had gotten permission to reincarnate Diedrag's current host into her peerage. Normally, such arrangements were not necessary for a sacred gear, even if it was a Longinus. After all, for all that they were praised, only the true Longinus had actually lived up to its name to allow its user to kill a god. More often than not, Longinus users got big-headed once they discovered what they held and ended up getting killed early in their lives. But boosted gear and divine dividing were exceptions. Not only for political reasons, what with Diedrich and Albion tearing through the forces of the three factions like through wet paper during the Great War, forcing them into the shameful position of banding together to take them out, but also for practical reasons. Those two sacred gears held a mode called Juggernaut Drive in which not only was the full power of the heavenly dragons within unleashed, but it also fed on the user's life force and sanity, most often than not sending them on rampages after which maps had to be redrawn. Thus, recruiting one of them was subjected to great scrutiny. Her mistake was dawdling. She kept putting it off, hoping for some event to allow her to make a dramatic entrance in Issei Hyodo's life and impress him enough to gain his loyalty. Such thoughts on her part were due to the ways she had recruited all her other peerage members. Akano was taken in after she was found homeless after her mother's family, the Himejima clan, attempted to have her killed due to considering her tainted for having fallen angel blood flowing through her veins. Kaniko was practically given to her as a gift by her brother when the young Nekosho was almost executed for her older sister's crimes, which recently she was cleared off. 
Yuto she saved when she found him near death in the snow after the blonde had escaped from the inhuman holy sword project of the church which had claimed the lives of all his friends. And lastly Gaspar which she also found near death after he had escaped from the abusive Tep's vampire clan where he was treated as dirt due to being a dampier. So, when she got word that fallen angels had taken residence in the abandoned church within her and Sona Citri's territory and were monitoring Issei, she saw it as an opportunity. It was a well-known fact that the Grigori have been killing off sacred gear users since the divine tools had first been created, both to eliminate the potential threat some may pose as well as out of spite against humans who received God's blessings in the form of the sacred gears while they had lost it when they fell. Her plan was simple. Once the fallen angels made a move on Issei, she would step in to save his life and then convince him to become her servant, for his own protection, of course. And if she was too late, then she could reincarnate him straight away and explain his new situation afterwards while highlighting the benefits. It would be easy to convince him, what with harems being legal in devil society and Issei proclaiming up and down about wanting to become a harem king for years now. As it turned out, she had been mistaken. Rather than attack him the fallen angels had apparently seduced him and taken him to the abandoned church where, after finding and destroying her flyer which would have allowed her to teleport at Issei's side, had killed him. By the time she had learned of this, it was already morning and Hyodo's body was found in a ditch, dead for several hours and thus no longer viable to reincarnate. There were time limits on the efficiency of the evil pieces to bring someone back to life. During the first ten minutes, they worked perfectly. In the ten minutes after that the evil pieces would drain twice or thrice as much power from the king to complete the reincarnation. Between the twenty and thirty minutes marks, the cost in terms of pawn value increased to the point that at the thirty minute mark it would take a queen piece to revive what would have cost a single pawn. She was somewhat surprised the cause of death was apparently a broken neck as she was expecting to find several holes in him from light spears, but in the end, that was an insignificant detail in the face of her failure. Her second mistake was thinking it would be a good idea to blow some steam by having a chess game against Sona which only made her more irritated. She often lost to the spectacled girl when she had a clear head, never mind when she was this irritated. Her humiliating defeat was put on hold when on the floor of the student council room, the HQ of Sona's peerage, appeared a dark orange teleportation circle. The crest was not one of the 72 pillars but she recognized it nevertheless and was unsurprised when one Naruto Uzumaki appeared from it. Yo! The whiskered blonde greeted them cheerfully. It's been a while, hasn't it, Sona, Rias? He gave them a wave. Uzumaki-sama, what brings you to Kuo? Sona inquired sternly as she did a curtsy while Rias bowed her head slightly. Naruto eyed her flatly, his smile fading. You just love to suck the happiness out of people, don't you? He sighed. You really should get yourself a boyfriend or something to help you get rid of that stick you have stuck up your. Naruto. Sona exclaimed blushing in embarrassment. Ass. The blonde finished shamelessly. You can't talk like that to Keicho. A blonde haired teen erupted indignantly. I just did, didn't I? Naruto tilted his head curiously, eyeing the boy. So apparently I can. That's not, I mean, the schoolboy stuttered. Saji, enough. Sona sighed. And Naruto, I know how much you like riling people up but it's been a long day. So, please, tell us to what we owe your visit. What a coincidence. Naruto's teasing smile dropped and eyed her and Rias seriously. It's those same events that brought me here today. Troubling news has reached me, that there are fallen angels present in Kuo, and that they have apparently been here for a while before this morning's incident. He did not need to say out loud that the incident was the death of Issei Hyodo. Sona and Rias exchanged a quick look that they hoped escaped Naruto's notice before the spectacled girl spoke up. There is no cause for concern. Sona said a bit too hurriedly. The situation is under control. Naruto raised a skeptical eyebrow. Are the fallen angels dead then? He asked. No, Sona scowled. She found it rather hypocritical that he was insinuating she should respond with lethal force, potentially beginning a serious conflict with the Grigori when Naruto himself had just recently put a lot of effort in exonerating someone whose death would have earned him a commendation. Then they've been kicked out of town? Naruto shot back. No, Sona forced herself to maintain her mostly calm expression. What sort of arrangement have you made with them, then? They've been in Kuo for what, a month now? Naruto pointed out, only to receive a silent shake of the head in response. Over her shoulder, he could see Rias withholding a grimace as she realized how out of hand she had allowed things to go. 
Then I guess the fallen angels are still a problem, aren't they? He deadpanned. They're being monitored. Sona defended. The way you're saying it, that's a recent thing. Naruto narrowed his eyes. Rias and I are dealing with it. We don't need any help. Sona declared heatedly. Do you agree with her, Rias? Naruto turned his attention towards the redhead. Yes. Sona and I can handle it. Rias spoke up, trying to sound sure of herself. Both Naruto and Sona's peerage could tell she was not sure at all, and the whiskered blonde stared at her for almost a minute, causing her to begin to blush from the intensity of his gaze. Okay. Naruto's chipper voice made them blink as he turned his attention to Sona once more. Okay. Sona blinked. You're going back. Of course. Naruto confirmed as his teleportation circle lit up beneath him, the crest of ten tails swirling into a central point right under his feet. After all, I need to tell Sirzex and Seraphal that they'll need to get personally involved, like they wanted in the first place. He nodded happily. At his words, the heiresses of the Citri and Gremory clans stiffened. I can imagine how thrilled they'll be when they hear they have an excuse to come see their little sisters. Naruto cheerfully continued to pour oil on the fire. That did not sit well with either of the girls. Being spoiled by their Mao elder siblings was one of the reasons why they had chosen to come in the human world in the first place, though a minor one. The main reason was to make a show of independence from their clans, to prove they did not need to be coddled, that they could stand up for themselves. Hence why they were refusing Naruto's interference in the first place. But involving their elder siblings was much worse, as they were Mao and the message sent would be unfavorable not only regarding the capabilities of the two heiresses, but also of the attachment and favoritism towards their siblings. The involvement of their parents would be preferable to that. In comparison, Naruto had no direct ties to either of them. Yes, he was the queen of the Beelzebub, but he was also their friend. It was almost disconcerting how hard it was not like the blonde, or even have a crush on him like Sona knew Rias did. So when it came down to it. Wait. Sona exclaimed, drawing Naruto's full attention. You can stay, she said in a normal tone. Really? Naruto tilted his head. Yes. We'll leave dealing with those fallen angels to you. Rias said, managing to keep the bitterness at not being able of taking revenge on those fallen by comforting herself with how an ultimate class devil, Queen of Beelzebub, would deal with them. Great. Naruto nodded cheerfully, his teleportation circle fading. Sona stared at him for a bit before speaking up. Why are you really here for, Naruto? The brunette asked suspiciously. Oh, you know. Getting in touch with the human world, getting a break from my duties, Naruto trailed off as he walked up to the two heiresses, making sure I don't lose my temper and reduce the number of the pillars when one of those pompous old assholes preached to me about blood purity. He finished in an undertone so that only the two kings would hear. Some would fail to see the problem with that. Sona's lip quirked in amusement at his aggravation. I'm one of them. But the Mao need to keep them around until the younger generation is ready to take over. Naruto gave them a pointed look. That's still a few years away, Rias pointed out. Hence why I'm here and not arranging for some old devil to fall down the stairs or something, Naruto grumbled. Well, have fun dealing with the fallen angels, Rias chuckled. Though keep in mind, if you cause an incident that restarts the Great War, it will be all your fault. Meh. Wouldn't be the first war fought because of me. Naruto said under his breath, thinking of the Akatsuki's hunt for the Jinchuriki. Come again. Sona blinked. I said it won't come to that. He said loudly. Can you tell me where they're based at? The abandoned church. Rias replied. You're not going to just storm the place, are you? Not yet. It hasn't come to that. Naruto shrugged as he turned and headed for the door. I'll see you girls later. Naruto. You came through teleportation. If you leave through the door, you may draw attention. Sona pointed out with a frown. Who said anything about a door? Naruto grinned and as soon as he reached the student council room door he disappeared in a yellow flash. How does he keep doing that? Rias pouted though she had to smile, her mood had certainly improved since his arrival. On his part, Naruto was not in that good of a mood. While he had indeed arrived in Kuo City via teleportation circle, his first stop had not been the academy. It had been the morgue. He had checked on the body of Issei Hyodo and had discovered that the cause of death was not the broken neck. It was not a physical wound of any sort, but a spiritual one. If a sacred gear is extracted from a host, 
That person would die in short order. That was a certainty of the supernatural world that come into being due to the various groups that had attempted and in some cases succeeded in ripping a sacred gear out of the person who had been born with it. The reason was surprisingly simple if you had the right background in magic. Sacred gears were within the soul of their possessor and wrapped around them were all that person's magic circuits to some extent, allowing them to use the divine tool. Simply ripping out the sacred gear also ripped apart the magic circuits and with them the portion of the soul they were sprouting from, always the brain and the heart, leading to certain death for the host. Issei Hyodo's corpse showed all the signs of such a thing having occurred. On his part, thanks to his six paths senjutsu, Naruto's senses were acute enough that he could sense a person's magic circuits perfectly. The Byakugan allowed Hanada and Hanabi the same. Because of this, they could first sever the connection between the host and the sacred gear by entangling the later from the magic circuits before finally extracting the divine tool safely, same with devil arms. It was how they were able to implant the devil arms in each other to test them out and then remove them. The fallen angels, however, lacked such means. Indeed, Azazel had made great advancements in his research on sacred gears to the point that an extraction was much less painful and it left the body intact. Hell. From the look of Hyodo's body, he had even lived a while longer after the extraction, short as it was. But in the end, that was the best the fallen angel leader had managed in terms of extraction and abandoned the research to avoid further loss of life, now focusing his attention on creating artificial sacred gears, if their informants were to be believed. The blonde also knew that simple possession, never mind use, of the devices capable of extracting sacred gears had been outlawed by Azazel. Which means that more than likely, these fallen angels are not acting on orders. Naruto concluded. He was tempted, oh so tempted, to just barge into that church, kick their asses and then drop them on Azazel's doormat with complaints and threats. It would be easy too, and the various pillar heads would likely praise him for it, which was all the more reason to not do it. Plus, Sirzex seems to believe that within the year we may be able to hold a peace treaty with heaven and the Grigori. So I probably shouldn't cause an interfaction incident just because a handful of low-ranked fallen angels, ones acting against orders at that, ruined Rias's plans of recruiting the current Securite. He concluded as he observed the church from afar through his sage mode. Within the abandoned church, specifically in its basement, he could sense a couple dozen human signatures as well as four fallen angels. Probably stray exorcists. He mused as he focused on the human signatures before turning his full attention to the fallen angels. Hum. One make and three female. The male and one of the females are significantly older in essence, the female one being quite a bit stronger than the rest, not four winged yet but close. Though the younger females are not as young as to have been born rather than be made by God, I would not be surprised if they were among the many who fell once God died. He decided. He was about to leave when something caught his attention. It was another energy signature, though it was faint and apparently fading already, yet at the same time quite potent. Draconic energy of this quality, could that be, the boosted gear? He wondered anxiously. It's not attached to anyone so it probably rejected being implanted in a new host. I heard sacred gears that contain souls are like that. He thought. I can't risk that remaining in the hands of the fallen angels, he decided. Without another thought he immersed himself further within sage mode, completely erasing his presence, before using the Mujin Maize he had learnt from Kakuo. It was the same technique that had earned Mew, the second Suchikage, the moniker non-person, as it completely erased the user's presence. It was a camouflage jutsu superior to both Jiraiya's Toten Jutsu and Iwagakur's traditional Maizaigakur no Jutsu, but it was to be expected considering it was created using Kokuo's control over vapors as inspiration, and with sage mode strengthening it further. Naruto walked right into the church, past the fallen angels and stray exorcists, and grabbed the Red Dragon Emperor's gauntlet before walking out leaving a cage bunchen under a henge as replacement, just in case they tried something with it. And if they did, the clone would dispel and they would think the boosted gear had been recycled into a new host. He also took stock of the fallen angels. The male looked like a middle-aged looking man with short black hair and dark blue eyes. His attire consisted of a pale violet trench coat over a white dress shirt with a matching ascot, black pants and shoes, and a black fedora. The oldest female was also the most scantily dressed one. Her attire consisted of a bra and thong that seemed made of leather straps, gloves that that run right up her arms, thigh high heel boots and shoulder guards, all in black. She also seemed to be the leader given how the rest seemed to defer to her. 
She was a violet-eyed beauty with dark hair that reached her waist with a busty seductive body. Not on par with his more voluptuous lovers, but a beauty nonetheless. The tallest amongst them was apparently also the youngest from what he could sense. She was a tall and buxom woman with long, navy blue hair that obscured her right eye and brown eyes. Her attire consisted of a violet, trenchcoat-like top with a wide collar, a matching miniskirt, and black-heeled shoes. The trenchcoat top was open at her chest, giving view to her breasts and cleavage. She also wore a gold necklace around her neck. The shortest, appearing to be in her early teens by human standards, was a girl with blonde hair styled into twin tails and blue eyes. She wore a gothic Lolita attire, which consisted of a black Lolita dress with white frills, a large black bow on the front, and a green jewel embedded on the collar, white thigh-high socks, and black shoes. She also wore a large black bow on top of her hair. All in all, he was not overly impressed with them. Oh, they interested him for several reasons, from who they were working for to what the hell they were thinking, messing around in the city of two Mao siblings, but that would have to wait until later. The older two had some skill though, he could tell from the way they moved, especially the female leader. Her walk was that of a predator, even if he sensed quite a superiority-inferiority complex within her. Before he could get too far from the church though, he felt them teleport away and extending his senses he felt them appear around an area under a barrier, within which were Rias and her peerage. Before he could even begin teleporting there himself, though, the devils teleported away leaving only two people within the barrier, and one of them held. Twilight Healing A sacred gear capable of healing anyone regardless of their species. The whiskered super devil instantly identified it. How could he not? It was amongst the first ten sacred gears he had extracted from strays. It was also the second hardest to replicate as a devil arm due to the tendency of demonic energy to cause harm rather than heal it. Even now both Twilight Healing and its still unnamed demonic variant were implanted inside Sakura who took great pleasure in using them during her duties at the top hospital in the underworld which was run by the Sea Tree, where she was amongst the top healers. After all, the two devices allowed the user to use healing on par with regeneration, and the user did not even need to have a medical background to use it as the devices both scanned and chose the optimal way of healing a wound. If the user did have proper medical knowledge, though, that's when the sacred gear and devil arm truly excelled, practically doing miracles. And I have a pretty good feeling what's going to happen to her. Naruto frowned as he thought of the female sacred gear bearer. First things first, though. He decided and within the next second he had reappeared back at Kuo Academy, specifically in a corner of Rias Occult Research Club room where he had had a clone place a Hiraishin marker. Naruto. Rias exclaimed in shock. What happened? Are you alright? Naruto demanded as he swiftly approached her and inspected the burn mark on her right side of her face. I'm fine. It was just some holy water. Rias tried to turn away. Naruto was having none of it as gently held her head still while he placed his free right hand on her face as it lit in a dark orange aura of chakra. He smirked slightly though when Rias let out a pleasured moan as his potent yang chakra regenerated her flesh to peak condition. That's better. Can't leave your pretty face scarred, can we? The whiskered blonde asked teasingly before becoming serious. What happened? A stray exorcist. Rias sighed. He killed Kaneko's client before she got there and attacked her. We went to back her up, but had to retreat when fallen angels arrived. None of you are hurt, are you? Naruto eyed Rias's servants. Her knight was Yuto Kiba, a handsome second year blonde teenager with gray eyes. He was also a sacred gear user, possessing the sword birth which allowed the creation of demonic swords. In truth, Naruto had discovered that he possessed a second sacred gear, the blade blacksmith which allowed the creation of holy swords. Given the boy's hatred for holy swords given the inhuman project of the church he had been forced through, Naruto had decided to keep that bit of information away from the knight for the time being. Her rook was Kaneko Tujo, a petite first-year girl with white hair and hazel eyes. She was Kuroka's younger sister, Sharon, a Nekosho. Unlike her older sibling though, she repressed her yukai side to the point of inhibiting her own capabilities, never mind attempting to use senjutsu. It was to the trauma of being accused and almost killed because of her sister's murders. Finally, her queen was Akano Himejima, as a beautiful young woman with a voluptuous figure around the same age as Rias with very long black hair and violet eyes. She was the daughter of the fallen angel Barakil, one of the Gregory leaders, 
whom she currently estranged from due to blaming him for his absence during her mother's death at the hands of the Himejima clan due to his status as a fallen angel. She held an inferiority complex, seeing herself as tainted due to being half fallen, a result of being hunted down by the Himejima clan herself. We're fine, Naruto kun. Akano giggled. Only Bucko was wounded. I see, that's good to hear. Naruto smiled. Well, this certainly makes my job easier, he informed them. What do you mean? Rias eyed him. I was planning on simply scaring the fallen angels off to avoid causing a bigger incident. Naruto explained. Now that their underlings have attacked you, I have an excuse to kick their asses. Naruto smirked. Want us to tag along? Rias offered. No, I think you've had enough excitement for the evening. Naruto chuckled. I'll let you know about the outcome tomorrow evening. With that, he teleported away to a marker by the abandoned church. He took a moment to consider using stealth once more before deciding against it. So, he barged in by kicking the doors to the other side of the church. There was nobody above though and he wasted no time going down to the basement where he arrived at the sight of the skimpy dressed leader of the group tying up with chains a cute blonde girl with green eyes and long blonde hair the same shade as his to a large black cross-like device that had green circuity all over. You know, I don't think she's into getting tied up. Naruto remarked making his presence known to the inattentive group of stray exorcists and fallen angels. You, on the other hand, fit the bill quite nicely. He addressed the black-haired fallen. Who the hell are you? She demanded. I sense some demonic energy from him, he must be one of those devil brats that serve the gremory and Citri heiresses. The male fallen remarked. It doesn't matter, we have more important things to do. Exorcists, kill him. The leader ordered before returning her attention to the blonde sacred gear holder. Now that's just plain rude. Naruto ignored the advancing stray exorcist as he strode towards the altar. The fallen angels ignored his words, but they could not ignore the screams of agony coming from the exorcists and when they turned around they were greeted to the sight of them all being pierced through several parts of their bodies each, though always the chest, by golden chains made of pure energy that soon faded, allowing the corpses to drop to the floor. Naruto himself was casually strolling through a path towards the altar that he had left between the bodies, his eyes fixed on the unnerved. Middleton, Kalawarner, Donaseek, the black-haired female fallen called out. Kill. My name, which you asked earlier, is Naruto Uzumaki. The whiskered blonde spoke pleasantly and just like that the words died in the violet-eyed fallen's mouth as she paled. You might have heard of me. I work directly for one of the Mao, Ajuka Beelzebub, as his queen he continued. At this piece of information, the other fallen angels, and even the bound human girl, shared their leader's reaction. Now I don't suppose I need to explain to you how exactly you've annoyed me, do I? Naruto tilted his head. You've killed a human in a town under the supervision of the Citri and Gremory pillars of the underworld, specifically the sisters of the Leviathan and Lucifer. You've then gone and killed one of the Gremory's customers and even attacked the heiress with holy water. W we didn't, the lowly blonde protested. The actions of your exorcists are your responsibility. Naruto cut her off. And now, you're about to do what? Harm another human sacred gear user. For all rights, I could kill the lot of you and I would probably get a call from Azazel to thank me for getting rid of some traitors. We're not traitors. Rainer growled. Really? Naruto raised an eyebrow in disbelief. Tell me, then, under what orders were you sent to this city under? And what are your names? I am Rainer, the blonde is Middleton, on her left is Kalawarner, and on her right is Donaseek. And this girl is Asi Argento. The black haired fallen said quickly. We were sent here to keep Issei Hyodo under surveillance, under Azazel's direct orders, she stated. And yet his body is now at the morgue, Naruto pointed out dryly. We were ordered to take him out, Rainer replied. Bullshit. Naruto snorted. What? We did. Rainer insisted. Azazel has a policy in dealing with sacred gear users. He either recruits them, keeps them under surveillance and only kills them if their sacred gear has awakened and sent them on a rampage. Naruto explained. And I'm pretty sure he would have made an exception in the case of Issei Hyodo given that he was to be the newest Red Dragon Emperor and Azazel's protege is the White Dragon Emperor. There's no way he would deprive him of his destined battle, he finished making quote marks. B but, we received orders. Rainer argued. From Azazel? Naruto asked. Well, no, Rainare's eyes widened in horror. 
Azazel is many things, quite a few not nice, but when he does take his position as leader of the Grigori seriously he does it well. Naruto stated. If he sent you here with specific orders, he would have been the one to recall you or change your orders. The Fallen seemed to have realized that as well and they were close to having panic attacks. Tell me, who passed on the orders? Naruto inquired. Do you know who it was? Who was his direct superior? I don't remember his name, exactly, but I'm pretty sure he's one of Kokebiel's subordinates. Rainer lost the ability to stand at that realization. For a good reason, too. Kokebiel was a known warmonger. Dissatisfied with the ceasefire at the end of the Great War, he had tried a few times to incite the other factions to conflict. And now, Rainer realized, he had used her group to cause trouble with the siblings of Tu Mao, the Leviathan and the Lucifer are all devils. I assume he gave similar orders about Asia here. Naruto inquired as he walked past the collapsed Rainer and began removing the human girl's bindings. Not exactly, Rainer admitted. This device was meant for her only. To extract her sacred gear. I just got curious about what was important about Issei Hyoto of all worthless humans, so I used him on him as well, she confessed. And you extracted the boosted gear, only to discover it was useless to you. Naruto concluded. Sacred gears that have a soul sealed inside them can very rarely be used by anyone but the person that was born with it. Unless one of you had an affinity for dragons that could impress one of the heavenly dragons, that gauntlet is useless to you. Naruto informed them. Aren't going to ask for it? Rainer inquired. I don't have an affinity for dragons either as far as I know. Naruto deflected. And if left alone for long enough, a sacred gear will be recycled by the system and appear in a newborn soon. He added before focusing on Asia Argento as he finished freeing her. You okay? Yes, Uzumaki Sama. The blonde trembled. Oi, don't be like that. Unlike with these four, I have no problem with you. You seem like a really nice girl. Naruto pat her head gently. How did you get mixed up with them, anyway? I was exiled by the church. Asia admitted. What for? Naruto frowned. This girl was perhaps one of the purest souls he had ever met. What could she have done to warrant that? I healed a devil I found injured, Asia admitted. So much for all the church's preaching about showing kindness to all. Naruto scowled. Still, of all the people you could have ended up with, it was with some that were going to kill you, that's some bad luck. What do you want to do now? I, I don't know. Asia wondered sadly. I don't have a place to go. Naruto eyed her thoughtfully. You're the type that can't stand to see people suffering, aren't you? That's why you went and healed a devil even if you knew your superiors would be upset about it. Yes. Asia admitted. Have you considered becoming a devil? Naruto asked her. W what? Asia asked in shock. A good friend of mine is a healer as well, a damn good one. Her name is Sakura Haruno. She spends quite a lot of her time at the Sea Tree Hospital healing people from various injuries. I'm sure she would love to have you working for her. Naruto explained. I. I would only have to heal people. I won't be forced to fight. Isn't that what devils do? Asia asked in confusion. I take it that's what the church's propaganda says. Naruto said dryly. No, not all devils fight. Take my boss, Ajuka, for instance. He barely does anything other than thinker with stuff in his lab. I doubt he's fought at all since the civil war. Sakura will teach you a few things so you could at least defend yourself, but most of the time you'll be healing people. I. I would like that. Asia smiled slightly before she gave him a scared look. But won't I go to hell when I die? No, Naruto chuckled. The thing about devils, angles and fallen is that we are partly spiritual beings. So in exchange to having very long lives, making us near immortal, we don't have after lives like humans do. Our souls simply get recycled, wiped clean and reincarnated in new forms without any memories. We basically live our lives and after lives at the same time. So, no hell? Asia asked timidly. No hell? Naruto replied in amusement. Aye. Asia began only to pause when Naruto patted her head. Take your time. This is a life changing decision, he advised. Even if you decide not to become a devil, at the very least I'll have Sakura give you some advice on using your twilight healing since she has one as well. Asia nodded thoughtfully as Naruto returned his attention to the fallen angels who had gathered together and were whispering to each other. Now then, what to do with you for? Naruto asked himself as he began releasing a bit of his power which by any other standards was a lot. 
I is it possible to work for you? Rainer trembled. Come again? Naruto blinked. We can't go back to the Grigori. We'll be seen as traitors. She admitted bitterly. Even if we try to explain to Azazel that Kokabiel interfered, it won't end well for us. We would not be the first ones Kokabiel made disappear for being loose ends, Kalawarner said bitterly. And you want to become devils? Naruto asked slowly. Want is a strong word. Donisik grunted. But what choice do we have? If you don't kill us, Kokabiel will. I could have you four imprisoned, Naruto pointed out. I've heard rumors the devil's prisons. I would rather die, Middle spat. Yeah, I see where you're coming from, Naruto admitted. Unless they were valuable enough, inmates were treated worse than in the blood prison in the elemental nations. So? Any chance we can work for you? Rainer almost pleaded. For me personally? No, Naruto replied thoughtfully. While I have a couple pawns left, they're both mutated pieces and you never know how badly they can react when used on people worth less than the evil piece used. We're not weak. Rainer snarled. I'm a high tier ultimate class devil. My regular pawn pieces are each worth more than a rook piece of an average high class devil. My mutated pawns are each worth more than a queen piece. Naruto revealed. Are you arrogant enough to believe you would be worth a queen? No, Rainer grit her teeth in humiliation. I'm not trying to put you down, you know. But if you don't know your limits, you won't live long in this world. At your age, I'm surprised you don't know this already. Naruto pointed out. I know all right. Rainer said bitterly. Naruto eyed her thoughtfully a bit before continuing. I do know a few people who would accept some of you in their peerage at my recommendation. The whiskered devil told them. Any of you good at stealth missions? I am. I've done my share in the past. Donisik admitted. Shikamaru Nara, Bishop of Beelzebub would accept you as a pawn. What do you say? Naruto eyed him. Okay. The man sighed. All right, I'll introduce you to him. Word of advice though, while Shika may be the laziest guy you're likely to meet short of the Mao Asmodeus, he's also the smartest guy the first no other than Ajuka, our boss. If you try to betray him or anything of the sort, you won't even know when you've died. Go it. Why yeah. The fedora wearing fallen gulped. Now then, which of you would be willing to work for Rias Gremory? Naruto asked the female fallen. You're kidding me. Middlet blinked. Nope, she was hoping to get a pawn out of Hyodo. She would have to look for another now, so why not one or two of you? Naruto pointed out. I'm not working for the spoiled princess, Rainer growled. Rather than answer her, Naruto focused on the other two. Fine. I'll do it. Kalawarner sighed but I'm not going to play student like the rest of her servants. I wouldn't mind going to school. Middlet admitted, drawing looks from her comrades. What? I'm centuries old and still look like this, but I've never gone to school. Maybe if I do, it'll make my body grow already. She said in annoyance. I don't know about that. It sounds more like a mistake God made when creating you. From what I've heard, he was getting pretty careless before, the great war ended. Naruto finished awkwardly but he could see it in the eyes of all four fallen angels that they knew what he had avoided saying. Yu Uzumaki-sama, Asia called to him. Naruto is fine, he cut her off. Naruto-san, then. Asia nodded to herself minutely. Could, could I go to school as well? I'm pretty sure Sakura would insist on it anyway, she was always a nerd, Naruto admitted. In the human world, I mean. Asia added, it can be arranged. Would you like to attend Kuo Academy in this city? Naruto offered. I would love that. Asia gave him a beautiful smile. Great. Naruto returned it before turning back towards Rainer where it became a thoughtful frown. Which leaves you, Rainer. Any particular skills that would help me place you? You sound like I'm some puppy you're trying to find a home for, Rainer grumbled. Not far from it, little bird. Naruto teased. Let me guess. Next you'll call me a crow. Rainer said sarcastically. No, I won't. Naruto's expression became flat, his right eye twitching. My past experiences involving crows are a crow getting shoved down my throat only to be pulled out the same way months later. How? Donisik asked slowly after a bewild silence. I don't know. And after I've thought about it, I realized I really, really, don't want to know, Naruto admitted. The fallen nodded dumbly. Anyway, skills. Naruto eyed Rainer. Well, 
Other than the basics all fall a no like using our light powers and wings, I'm good at seduction. Rainer offered. Anything else? Naruto prompted. Some hand-to-hand -hand combat, maybe? I've learned some from Barakil during the war, but I haven't really practiced it. Rainer admitted. Hmm, Hanada will take you. Naruto eventually nodded. She's the Knight of Beelzebub and recently promoted to Ultimate Class. She's a really kind girl, but if you piss her off, well, let's just say that as her boyfriend, I will have to get rid of your horribly mangled corpse. Got it, he asked pleasantly receiving a terrified nod. Good, let's get this over with. He quickly sent some messages to Sakura, Hanada and Shikamaru and within the next five minutes all three had teleported over. Over the next couple hours, they got to know their potential peerage members, eventually Shikamaru reincarnating Donasik with two pawns and Hanada doing so with Rainer using three, while Sakura made Asia her bishop. What about us? Middle asked warily. Rias got burnt with some holy water this evening. I healed her, but I think we should give her some time to cool off before introducing you too. Naruto replied, receiving nervous nods. I'll take you to her tomorrow after school. Until then, you can stay at my house. In the underworld? Kalawarner asked warily. No, in this city. Naruto corrected. I plan on staying around for a while, so I bought a house here. Naruto, since Asia will be attending Kuo, can she stay at your place? I could arrange a house for her but, she's led a pretty sheltered life with the church and doesn't know much of life in Japan. Sakura admitted. Sure. I don't mind. Naruto accepted. Rainer as well. Hanada added. What? Why? The newly reincarnated pawn exclaimed. Because I will be moving in as well with my younger sister, so there's no point in sending you elsewhere. Hanada explained. Don't worry, my house has plenty of room. Naruto assured them. All right then, but just how many people will there be living there? Rainer asked warily. Well, other than those already mentioned, Jean and Kuroka will be moving in as well. Naruto admitted. Some of my other peerage members will drop by and stay for a while at times, but not on a permanent basis. Jean the former exorcist and Kuroka the former SS rank stray devil, Rainer paled. Don't worry, they're probably the nicest members of my peerage, Naruto assured her. That's not a nice thing to say. Isobu and Chomei are really sweet, Hanada admonished him. True, but they are just as likely to kill her on accident as the rest of the biju or on a bad day. Naruto deadpanned. Well, I can't argue with that. Hanada admitted. Hey, where's Shikamaru? Sakura spoke up. Oh, he took Donasik to the underworld with him. Hanada replied. Ah, poor guy. Sakura winced. Why? What's up? Kalawarner frowned. Now that Shika has a new minion, he's going to drop as much as his own workload on him as he can get away with. Naruto deadpanned. That guy was born to be a devil of sloth to be continued. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.